All right, it is, is it 6.04 uh, p.m., uh, March the 4th. I call to order the um, uh, Public Works Committee. I have myself here, um, Ms. Carol King, our city administrator, um, and Mr. Matt Fleeman's out there as well. Uh, we're waiting on Mr. Reynolds, so we're going to kind of slow boat this a little bit, and he'll be here in just a few minutes. All right. Uh, first of all, public comment. Do we have anything for today's agenda? Public comments. Okay. All right. Then. All right. Yeah. And then, uh, okay, uh, read, what do I hear on reading and approval of minutes? Motion, motion to... I'm sorry. Yeah, motion to approve the minutes from January the 5th as presented. Um, make it February 5th. What did I say? January. Uh, February. I'm re looking at it, reading, and had it wrong. From February the 5th. All right. Um, I will second that. Any discussion? No. No, no discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed like sign, the eyes have it. All right. Uh, reports and communications from city officers. Mr. Schleman. All right. There you go. <clears throat> so uh, I want to give you a quick update on some of the grants that we're working on. Um, as you're aware, we have the $4 million um, skip grant, which is sewer rehabilitation. Uh, we executed the contract during February's uh, council meeting. Uh, it's in the, it's gone through, everyone's got to go through. It's in the hands. They, they're going to execute their copy. We should have that within the next week. Um, and then we'll be starting a, like a pre-construction meeting to um, outline work efforts and then the uh, outlining the additional work that we're going to include into the contract. <clears throat> Uh, as far as Oak Park Drive, KCI in the city, uh, we generated preliminary design drawings. We submitted them to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineer, uh, Engineers. Uh, we actually met the Army Corps out there. We walked the project. Um, they're they're kind of inundated because there are a lot of these score grants that the Army Corps is involved in, so their, their review time is a little bit longer than normal. Um, we're still waiting on feedback from them. Uh, the, the main reason being uh, a, a large portion of the Oak, Oak Park Oak, Oak Park Drive project was um, a stream that was piped in and it, it discharged at this point. And what we're trying to do is obviously daylight the stream and relocate it. And so we're going to be relocating the, the tie in point. And that's the, what the Army Corps of Engineers ultimately has to sign off on. So we keep heckling them um, and hopefully they'll get us a response sooner or later. Is there anything more than a response that it's okay, or do they have? It's basically that's it just boils down to the, it's okay, and then and then we can move ahead with score and uh, contracts and you know shovels in the ground <clears throat> for the EMD grant. Um, if you had an opportunity to come up here, we actually uh, completed uh, we successfully completed uh, two public input sessions, uh, which were required by the federal regulations. Uh, KCI is currently compiling all of the public input data they received, and they're trying to generate a map uh, to, and a list to go with it, um, basically to finalize the existing watershed study maps and uh, the proposed watershed maps. Uh, KCI is looking to finalize this uh, EMD master plan report and, and get it to us April or May. Um, I would, I, I, they're probably going to get us somewhere in between. So I'm looking to probably bring it before committee and council in May to kind of just go over some of the highlights of the report. This rounds it's sitting at your, it's in a What's going on. Hey, let me know that uh, Mr. Reynolds has joined us. And we are, as uh, we're at the, um, just the updates grant. And and those are the three grants that we're working on. All right. Move on to the stormwater uh, discussion. Sure. All right, so stormwater discussion. Um, at this point, we've had uh, several discussions about a program that KCI investigated a fee schedule. 
Uh, I've written a report identifying minimum fees necessary um, to include all the regulatory steps necessary to move forward with a standalone division. Um, and we're kind of at a point now, um, I feel like I've addressed everything that you guys have asked. Um, I'm not sure if there's more you would like for me to address. I mean, the way I look at it is we ultimately have um, basically three issues that we need to resolve. Um, and these three issues, as it relates to stormwater, breaks down to one, maintenance of our existing infrastructure in the street right of ways, maintenance of private property infrastructure, and flooding. Um, in accordance with our joint MS4 permit, the only one of those three that we're responsible for is the infrastructure in our street right-of-ways. Um, in our street right-of-ways, if you don't know, um, we have about 60 miles of storm pipes. We have about 30 miles of ditches. We have over 3,000 catch basins, eight stormwater detention ponds. And kind of using a back of envelope calculation um, based on material costs and labor and equipment costs using city employees, um, our stormwater system has an asset value north of $50 million. Um, it's a big system and it continues to grow larger with every development that we add. Um, now those values that I use to give you your asset value is obviously um, city labor, city equipment. If we contract it, that value is going to go up, but I just kind of wanted to give a ballpark to start discussing this. Currently, if you don't know, uh, we allocate $34,000 a year for the maintenance and repair of our stormwater system. Um, now, don't get me wrong, we make that go as far as it possibly can go. Uh, in the last few years, as part of a renewed interest by the mayor, council, um, you know, the public works department, we, we've transitioned the streets department to, to essentially be a fully functioning stormwater crew. Um, I've replaced every staff member in there. It's a complete different crew. Um, and, and they've been, and their efforts have been refocused and redirected to pipe replacement, ditch cleaning, catch basin inspections and repairs. Um, you know, right now we're out there at Bishop Heights. We're ditching the entire neighborhood. Um, we're doing more now than they had for years. Uh, there's still years of work to accomplish in maintaining our system. Uh, it, we're at the point now with our division that we, we, we're about three to four weeks booked out. And that's not even including the curb work. Uh, that's just the, the workload that we have. Um, so in, in reviewing the three issues that we have with, you know, the stormwater and potentially what we're going to do, you know, if your intention is to focus on um, city infrastructure, you know, that's what we have. That's what we're doing. Um, we can continue down the path of doing what we do right now without a fee, without a division. Uh, we can invest more in the street department or obviously there's more return on investment if there is a, a fee because there's, you know, more people, you know. Um, more materials, et cetera. Now, the second one is the infrastructure on private property. Um, and if we're trying to address that, uh, let's be clear, we are the only, we would be the only entity in Greenville County doing this. Not the county, not the city of Greenville, not any of our sister cities, not even the SCDOT takes on this liability because that's what it is, it's a liability. Um, But let's be real. What we do now, and I don't know if you guys really know, but <clears throat> the city already has an above and beyond approach that no one else in the county has, right? We, we tell you, we'll give you guys, we'll give you equipment, we'll give you fill dirt, stone. All you have to do is buy the pipe or steal a phrase from the mayor. All you have to do is have a little skin in the game, little skin in the game, and it'll be done. And we've used this process time and time again over the last five years, and it's been successful, it's been very successful. We give you the know-how, we give you the equipment, we get on it. This above and beyond approach, which you guys currently have in your policies and ordinances works. And it allows us to address infrastructure on private property. But if you're like, hey, that program's not good enough, we've just, you know, we just want to focus on that work and, and get our staff on that property and start doing these pipes, uh, my recommendation is to look to the report that I generated and, pro and provided to you um, that, that gave you a stormwater fee and the setup of the division and, and know that if, if this is your intention to go this way, 
Um, the recommendation is to follow the fee structure that I presented or, or, or identified in that report, because that is the funding that is going to be required to go down this road. Um, please be aware that with this, with this path comes significant liability um, and caution should be taken if, 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 if we continue down the path. Um, it's not going to be day one, uh, me and the guys out there digging ditches. We have to go through legal we're gonna to have to go through a number of steps and processes to hammer down uh, what we can and can't do. Um, but that's not saying we can't do it. And that's not saying we won't do it. That's just saying that, you know, option one, we're just gonna do our infrastructure, fee, no fee. This option, you're gonna need a fee and you're gonna need a way to support it. Um, and the last problem of the three prongs and everyone loves to talk about it is flooding. Um, and if the solution you're looking to is to resolve flooding, <laughs> I really recommend that you temper your expectations. All right. No matter how hard we try, no matter what we do, um, we, we can't control the rain. All right. We can't, we, we cannot in any way, shape or form control the volume of water that comes and hits us. Right. Um, and even with the best, most up-to-date design stormwater system, it's still not going to fix it, all right? And as an engineer, I love to tell this, all right? You know, if you're designing a water main, if you're designing a sewer main, right, we figure out how much we could possibly ever need, right? This, is, this pipe has to be this big. And then we multiply it by two and a half times called the safety factor to ensure that that water line or that sewer main can serve two and a half times what we said was the maximum number of people that are going to be there. Right. But when it comes to stormwater systems, we say, you know what, we're going to say, hey, a 25 year storm, it rains a couple inches. We're going to design at this threshold and that's good enough. And when it, you know, that's a 25 year storm. We have 100 year storms three times a week. We have 500 year storms once a year, like once a month. Right. So even these overly designed stormwater systems, I can tell you, are always designed to fail because they are not designed with the same criticality that you would find in a water infrastructure, in a sewer infrastructure. And so flooding, no matter what we do, there will always be flooding, right? Now that's not to say that we should just throw our hands up and walk away, right? We can do things, right? And we had KCI look at some of these issues and some of these flooding issues and their recommendations were, were sound. In some situations it said, hey, you need to buy this property from these owners and move them out. Right. That's a tough decision. And I'm glad you're making it, not me. All right. And in some cases, it was listen, you guys are going to have to redevelop this entire neighborhood. You're going to have to put in a stormwater system. You're going to have to curb and gutter. And you're looking at millions of dollars, millions of dollars to do this. And on paper, I can tell you that looks great. I mean, yeah, it'll work for the 25 year storms or whatever. The problem is, is that when you start really getting into the nuts and bolts of it and trying to put in a redevelop a neighborhood, Infrastructure is already in place. Stormwater system has to be set perfectly so that you have gravity because we don't pump. Water flows downhill. We're not going to put any energy to it, right? And if the Greenville water main is there, your stormwater system can't go in. And so what, what maybe a $3 million project is now a $6 million project because you got to pay Greenville water to move their water main. And this goes the same for telecommunication and, and buried power or sewer system. Um, now let's, again, not to say that we can't do it, Anything, you know, here, all you need is time, people, and money, and anything can get done. Um, but if we go down that road that we're going to just throw money at flooding, all right, and we're going to throw money at flooding, that's up to you guys. Um, temper your expectations. Know that we can only solve what we can solve. Um, and just know that the recommendation, the fee structure that I presented in my report does not in any way, shape, or form reflect what the investment is going to be on your part, all right? So it's back on you guys to tell me what you want. And let me just leave you with one thing, is that the Public Works Department will support any decision you guys make, and we will work diligently as possible to make it as successful as any Public Works Department can. Questions? Just a comment. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's probably the most impassioned speech I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, See, when I write it out, I don't get nervous and start stuttering. <laughs> you know, so what's funny, I was going to say, that ending, you had that written out, didn't you? I had the whole thing written out. <laughs> um, no, I think first, thank you for thank you for all your work on it. And, and certainly, I, you won't hear this council or this councilman from one person um, complain about your efforts and what your department does um, and the efforts that you've had on something that you can see that's near and dear to several of us up here. Um, or at least something that that we want to find a way that we can address it. Um, so forgive me, I don't have anything written out. So, um, but as as impassioned as you are about that, the big concern I've said over and over is the the dollar amount that's concerned me about this. Is it's it's one that it looks astronomical, and uh, the unintended amount that we may cause concerns me greatly. Um, so. I think the systematic way that we've kind of handled it, taking your lead on uh, hiring KCI and just in looking at the, the various options um, has been a, a systematic approach that I appreciate. Uh, the dollar approach terrifies me. Um, so as I look at it, I think, um, you know, as a city charging public works with making sure we're doing as much as we can possibly do in-house is extremely important. Charging public works as well as the administrator at, with looking for um, appropriate grants like we just did for Basin 4, Basin 3, whichever one. Um, for sewer? Um, I'm sorry, stormwater, excuse me. Yeah, and, RG, and it's, it's yes, Basin, it would be Basin 4, yes. They all run together. Uh, so looking for those federal monies that make sense that that may be the one time big chunk that we can look and say, okay, we can we can tackle a large project here. That makes sense uh, as a system from the city to me. Going in saying, let's take a fee structure for any number of our new subdivisions that have had appropriate stormwater engineering done. Let's tack on a stormwater fee for those guys who you know, frankly, all of their costs was on the front end. The engineering was done on the front end to make sure they didn't have stormwater issues. But we're going to tell those guys, hey, you're going to need to pay for the subdivisions that were pre-1992 one, whatever the Clean Water Act was, where before we gave real thought to stormwater systems. Um, yeah, it's that concerns me greatly. 2004 here in Malden. Oh, 2004. <laughs> well, it took a while to get from D.C. to here. Um, <laughs> so... That concerns me greatly. And that's, again, I didn't have Mr. Fleeman's benefit of prepared notes, but right off the cuff, that's but what's been really bothering me about this this um, this problem that we're facing. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chair and, and hear some more thoughts from committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Fleeman, for reading your notes very well tonight and passionately. Um, I made some scribble notes in addition to what we've been talking about for months and um, tend to agree wholeheartedly with Mr. Reynolds. Um, <clears throat> the word caution seemed to stand out to me tonight. Um, I haven't been shy in stating that the fee structure, um, the cost and the liability on that um, frightens me. I don't know of a better adjective to use um, to describe that. Um, I think that from my perspective, I would like to see your department continue to do what we're doing with the curbing, with cleaning the ditches, with um, the things that you mentioned um, tonight with the pipe replacement. Those are things that I think fell by the wayside for, for years and unfortunately helped us get to a little, I mean, we can blame a little bit of that of where we are today. Um, so. I would like to see, because we haven't been actively doing all those things historically for a long amount of time, uh, maybe in the last couple of years or so, so if, if that long. So for me, I would like to see more of that and reports back to committee on where we are, what's being done, and how that is assisting with some of the issues that we're having um, to just go ahead and decide to to move forward with a new 
division. I'm not ready to commit to that today um, for many reasons, as we discussed. So that's kind of where I am with it now. That's not to say that we can't have a goal perhaps to look at and, and we know the things that we can do. We know what that fee structure looks like. Um, <clears throat> but I just, at this point, as I said last meeting, have um, great concerns with tacking on a fee to 100% of the folks, commercial and residential in our city, um, when a lot of those aren't even affected by this. So um, the commercial piece scares me, but without the commercial piece, then you don't have the revenue structure coming in. So I, for me, I, I have to put the brakes on um, form in a whole new division at this point in time. Doesn't mean we can't discuss it down the road, um, but that's where I am with it. And closing thoughts, I, I thought about this as well, and we don't have to discuss this tonight, but in thinking of a fee structure and how it impacts everyone, our pump stations are totally different. So our neighborhoods that have, how many do we have with pump stations now? Three. And those are fees that are assessed to those residents that live in those neighborhoods and, and those lots um, are assessed with their property tax. So it's not apples to apples, but I think it's something we're throwing out there to think about in this whole fee structure process. Thank you. Okay, so in the past, we didn't touch ditches. We didn't do a lot of things. If you go look in some of these neighborhoods where there were ditches is now flat lawn. The city took on the responsibility to the roads that we own and said, we're gonna maintain that. And that included the sewer and the, I'm not sorry, sewer, the, uh, the stormwater. We didn't do that. We just took just those alone. The fee number is, is astronomical. So if we don't even, if we didn't take on anything else, we just fix those ditches, we'd be better off than we are now. We don't have the funding to do that, do we, Mr. Fleeman? Not all at once, no. 60 something miles or, right? But there's there's 28 miles of ditches. 28 miles of ditches. We do not have money for 28 miles of ditches that we didn't maintain. Maybe if we'd been doing it all along, like to be honest, we should have been as a city. That was really our responsibility. We said, no, 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 we're gonna use it for other things. Some of those things are, you know, I find fantastic, but that wasn't the infrastructure of the building of this city. That wasn't the important thing in the city. We were not maintaining what the city was supposed to do. And so now we owe that. So I do believe we need to add a fee structure to that. I am anti-tax as big as anybody else. This is not something that's funded. We have no mechanism to fund any of this. We have $10 million that, that's... Um, Engineering firm basically said, here are your worst problems in Malden, and it's causing flooding. It's shutting us down in certain areas. It is destroying homes in certain areas. Some places, okay, fair enough, it's it's flooded there for years. A lot of it, though, is, is newer because we didn't maintain what already existed, right? Shame on the councils before this one. They didn't want to deal with it. The thing was, don't get in the middle of this. Pretend it doesn't exist. Let's not let's let the people, we'll just pretend we don't hear them. Let them go to county. County doesn't do anything. State doesn't do anything. Luckily, we're getting grants now. State wants to do something. They just can't own this. Okay. We've taken this responsibility to go out and say, hey, we want to try and help. Can we fix everything? No. You know, and, and in my job, one of my things that I do is I say, all right, we can't fix everything, but we can make it better than it is now. And that we definitely can do. So I'm going to make a request that next month's committee meeting that we have, if you could take the proposal you already have. Uh, bring it back to us with, uh, with bring it back, formally bring it back in as a actually um, as one of our um, items here. And I'd like to vote on us actually developing this. And we may change it. We may have some discussion on it. Let's get this voting that we've talked enough. And if we say no, then the people can come back and, you know, we're, but right now we're in a bit of a stall. And if we end up, if the committee says we're not doing it, if I'm the only one for it, so be it, but I wanna, I wanna get it off the discussion thing. So next month we can do that with the fees, uh, with the fee structures. Uh, in addition, I do know the liability piece uh, as far as some of the stuff, some of the stuff's private we need because it impacts the whole city. There's other things where people, uh, the veteran I heard about that can't afford to fix a pipe that goes under his property, just can't afford it. 
maybe there's some opportunity to take some of that and do a, cause it does impact others, but maybe a grant program from this fee. We put so much aside that's limiting our liability and the fact that we're giving a grant for somebody to do something versus us doing it. Is there something, I'm just throwing that out as an idea, but is that a way to limit our liability? There are some things we can do. We may not be able to do everything we want, but we can do more than we're doing now. And then, so I'd like to bring this up again next, or our next committee meeting next month with that proposal. We start really working on it. I think you've done a great job collecting all this information. We've had people look at this. We didn't have them look at it because we didn't want to do something about it. We do. We're just trying to figure out how to pay for it. And and I, I hate the idea of adding any kind of fees to anybody. But this is a city problem. It is the neighborhoods that are in worse shape. That's because they're part of the city and the city didn't take care of them. How do we do that? And I think we need to get more into the, the nuts and bolts on this. So let's bring this up next time and let's have that discussion and put some votes to it. And if it's no, I mean, we can come back with no, but, okay? but that's, that's, we would get moving on it. So does that make sense to everyone? Mm -hmm. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, no. And I think, you know, the real travesty of this is you and I have set through meetings as well. We see this problem impacting um, neighbors and friends, you know, it's a real impact. And right. so, you know, certainly hearing of a veteran that, can't pay for the pipes or a new homeowner that bought a house that didn't know there was an issue and you know, that pulls at the heartstrings. Um, and, and, you know, certainly I have empathy and pity and, and all those things. Um, it, it would have, when I say this, it has to impact the total, like it has to impact the city or somebody does have to fix something and maybe they can't afford it, but it's going to impact others. That's where I look. I'm not just saying yeah. we're going to fix everything in everybody's yard because just be clear on that. Right, right. We need to get something done. Well, no, and I think, but but the other point I wanted to make in that uh, comment is, you know, while while I completely agree over the years, we've not done a great job of maintaining um, that system. We've not done a great job of maintaining systems um, as a total in public works. We're doing much better now, but some of these areas are impacted not because the city didn't maintain it, but because thought to the whole process of stormwater changed drastically where we finally figured out, hey, it's a bad idea to run, to a, run a storm pipe under someone's house. So while, you know, as a, as a representative of the city, I certainly want to take blame for, um, you know, past undone work. True. And, and on that, just, you know, most of those cases, it wasn't that it wasn't designed properly. It wasn't installed properly. I totally agree. Right. And so, you know, there's, it's one of those that when when building was going on, and I, what I'm thankful for now is this building department currently does a great job of getting out to projects um, at, at certain benchmarks and checking and make sure that stormwater is done correctly, electrical is done correctly. So I don't know that all uh, licensing departments and permit offices have always been that way. So to your point, installation could have been shoddy and crazy and bad in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and we're reaping the benefits of that now. So while I certainly think there's some responsibility of the citizens of Malton and this council in particular, um, I'm not willing to bear all that weight. <laughs> Nor am I. Nor am I. And, I. and I was referring to some of that. That's why I was saying if there's something else. And there's also grants for people outside of Malton too, that we can try to help them with. And I think to your point on that, that would be something, Mr. Fleeman, I would want us to become abundantly versed in is how we can do a better job of assisting those who have an issue on pi private property, seek out funding outside of the city, you know, be it veterans administrations, be it FDA, name your acronym. Um, you're, you're well versed in a lot of things. That'd be something else I'd tack onto your resume of, I also know how to do this alphabet soup of, of, getting funding for folks who may be in a situation that, that they can't fix it. Um, and, and there aren't other places, other avenues to find money and help. And by the way, you're, you're one of the best at getting grants. So you need, there you go. So. All right. Any other discussion? All right. Well, thank you on that. All right. Now let's get to some work here. Um, authorization to sell equipment. All right, so authorization is requested to move forward with the listing of a uh, small list of, of vehicles and equipment uh, on the GovDeals website. Um, basically, um, in order for us to sell anything, it has to be a resolution on your guys' part. 
Uh, the list of things you have here, we have generator from the fire station uh, that they just replaced theirs over on uh, Beaster Road. We have a couple old police cars. We have a couple old trucks that have been replaced with uh, the new like landscaping trucks and parks. Um, and then we have you know old BDS truck, and then we also have um, the old old backhoe that just needs to be getting rid of. So, just out of curiosity, is that Tacoma Toyota? Is that the little one that says the golf carts are faster? Yes. I want to make sure. I expect to get a pretty penny for it. To be honest with you, it's a nice truck. So, so do I hear a motion, Chairman? Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to forward to full council with a recommendation of approval of the authorization to proceed with the sale on the uh, items listed here in your packet. Do you have a second? Second. I have a second. Uh, any discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. The ayes have it. it. Moves to full council. All right. Public comments. Please uh, state your name and address. Hi, I'm the president of the board at Carlton Place. I live at 504 Canewood Place, and I'm here representing the neighborhood and my neighbors at 507 Canewood Place. Um, in October, they had this. They had a sewer backup in their neighborhood, in inside our neighborhood, that went from their lateral to inside their house. And we've had several contacts between us and the Malden Sanitation Department, but we haven't gotten um, a clear response about the issue. And it's really difficult to figure out who is responsible for the fixing of the pipe. When we had a contractor come out, it was RAH. Um, they found that the roots that clogged the pipe were coming from inside the Malden lines. And where their townhome is, and their townhome is 507, it's directly in their front yard. So they're, where it got clogged was less than six foot from the pipe. And it's misshapen, their lateral. And I don't know that if it has misshapen or not where the pipes connect. So when I sent a letter to Malden on, in January the first of the year, all I got back was we have thoroughly reviewed the situation and determined it's not a city issue. But that's not enough for me to say that either the neighborhood or the homeowner can dig up that pipe, fix it, or get that close to the Malden, Malden main sewer. So I really want someone to look at the issue more clearly and state how we need to proceed being so close because we don't want to hurt city infrastructure. It's definitely, with, definitely within the 12 foot of the easement that Malden has being directly in their front yard. And our front yards are the sizes of postage stamps. So we, I like the issue to be looked at um, again and more thoroughly um, with a little bit better than a one sentence. Sorry. Um, I've got all, I've got this paperwork here if y'all would like to review it. So during the section, we can't respond back. I should have said that earlier. I understand. We can talk afterwards. Yeah, that's fine. But I'll give you the information to look over about it now. All right, thank you. Do you have anything else? Marvin. Please state name and address, please. Sir. Apartment 22B, Greenville, South Carolina. Um, I guess I'm talking on behalf of uh, my companion, my love. She's, uh, we've been together something like 20 something years. And uh, this occurred, the first incidence of a flood occurred 2022 in October, when my family was in the house and they had to leave because we had raw sewage on the first floor. The town came out and cleaned the pipes I guess you call it rooted it out. And so uh, it then occurred, the same thing ha occurred in the middle of the year. And just this recently in October, it occurred again. So we did, like uh, Elena said, we did have RAH come out. We've actually had two or three other companies come out and do a cleaning of the lines and an inspection. And most recently we had, um, I think it was in November, um, came out 
Rotor Rooter came out and said, there are no intrusions in the line, it's safe to use. But another company said, you have a distorted uh, transition where the main line and the lateral line is. So right now we're, we're not sure what to do. And uh, Jane is facing medical issues. I uh, won't get into that, but it's, a, it's at the point now where she can't even talk about it. And it's very difficult uh, for us to go on like this. So we'd like to get this thing resolved. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? All right, if not, we'll go, we'll go down and move to uh, committee concerns. All right, we're good. All right, now what do I hear on adjournment? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. We are adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I do apologize for my tardiness. All right. Response. Yeah. Go camp out downstairs. <laughs> Y'all have to stay though to listen to Officer Bond's presentation. All right, we will call the next committee meeting to order. This is the Recreation Committee. It is now 6.39 p.m. on March 4th. Uh, we have in attendance all members of the committee, which includes uh, Mr. Reynolds, Ms. Stenbeck. Uh, we also have the city administrator in the, in the building, as well as our recreation director. I know I saw him. There he is. There he is, over in the corner. There's Bart. All right, so first stop, we have public comment. This is for items that are on the agenda, if anyone has any public comments. Hearing none, we have next up is reading and approval of the minutes. What's the pleasure of the committee? Motion to approve. I hear a motion to approve. Is there a second? Is there, I got a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of approval of the minutes say aye. 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 The ayes have it. We will move on to report from the uh, city officers. So, Bart, if you'd make your way on up. Thank you, Mr. Allgood. Hope everybody's doing good tonight. Uh, first off, we'll start off with the Senior Center. Uh, the Senior Center State Appropriated uh, Project uh, we're working on. Uh, go down the list a little bit for you and kind of tell you what we've done and what we're fixing to start. Uh, the roof replacement will be uh, starting the end of March. The contractor has been selected. Public Works uh, worked on that. Thank you for their help on that. Also, the uh, multi-purpose court renovation, um, the RFP, RFQ is out right now. Um, it's on the city website and on a couple of other, so we can hopefully get some bids off that. And also, the walking trail uh, renovation is on the same as well. Uh, the ADA bathroom uh, has been complete. They finished that up Friday of last week. We were down one day on a Thursday, and then we opened up Friday. Uh, we had limited access to bathrooms until about midday Friday. We did put out a port john out there just so uh, we would have a facility for the seniors to go to. Um, the flooring replacement upstairs is complete. Uh, 
the door replacement, uh, the parts have been ordered, the new doors have been ordered, and uh, probably looking at mid-March, uh, end of March for that to be finished. Um, the interior painting upstairs is complete. Uh, the water fountain upgrades, Public Works has uh, purchased those and just waiting for them to get those up on a day that's slow, which is not much at the senior center. Jeff Burrow, Jeff, Jeff Bureaus is uh, Bureaus is our new senior coordinator. Uh, he started last week. Uh, he's in full swing. Uh, he uh, has a vast of knowledge of senior adults, so we're very happy to have him as well. Uh, so we're, the rec department is basically fully staffed now with him being hired, and we had a position open at Sports Center, and that has been uh, filled as well. Uh, to also bring y'all as attention, and you may be getting an email or two, but um, we have been closing the senior center down uh, in the afternoons, along with businesses along Butler Road as well, of people parking in the uh, parking lot. Uh, I've gotten uh, filtered a couple emails and phone calls from seniors, uh, really concerned that they cannot get out of the parking lot uh, in the afternoons. Actually, we have to cut our program short because uh, they're just, it's just a lot of people in one location and it's just a lot of congestion going on. And the problem that we're having is people use it as a cut through. And a lady stopped me the other day and she was just concerned of people coming through that park lot cutting through and she was out there with her kids walking and on the playground. So we're not shutting it down every day, but we shut it down today. And I have gotten some phone calls, some upset parents, but, you know, I think a lot of it is people just don't want to be in a car line. Uh, no one likes a car line. I don't like a car line, but it is what it is. So we're, we're making, if you get a phone call from me, the folks, it's, it is also ordinance that was passed. I don't know what year, but it, you cannot park there, pick up a kid. You can go in there and play basketball or baseball during those days. And we have a person working that gate and we'll let you in if you're there to, use the playground or whatever, but not to pick up kids. Uh, and so they do not use the crosswalk. They go down the bottom end and walk across. I'm really concerned about the kids uh, doing that. I think the police department has done a good job of trying to uh, to get them to use the crosswalk, but, you know, it's just that's the problem that we're having. And it's been that problem for years and years. So can't keep kicking that can down the road, we've got to address it. And so that's what we're trying to do as far as our staff is, is do that. I'll be happy to answer any questions on that if y'all like, uh, if you have any. Um, our spring registration is complete. We're still uh, adding some kids. Our spring baseball and softball, we've got about 525 kids, which is an upswing from last year. Black football is around 250. Boys lacrosse is around 75. So that baseball and softball is girls and boys. And so uh, actually this past weekend, our basketball finished up. Our 8U girls won the state. They beat Bluffton. Uh, they played up in Pickens. Our 12U boys came runner up. They played in Easley. I was over there easily at uh, yesterday morning. They played around noon and they lost to East Columbia. Uh, they had to be beaten twice and they, uh, they came up short, but that's okay. They did a had a good run, and very proud of those folks. Uh, we will have the girls here next month for the excuse me this month uh, for a council meeting to kind of uh, give them a presentation as well. And that's all I have as far as updates. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Conlander? Yeah. So obviously the the big issue you talked about with the kids crossing the street and the issues we're having over there with traffic. What's, um, I'm assuming we've communicated with the high school. What's their, been their response? Are they helping the situation at all? What's the situation there? Uh, not much of a response. I just want to be honest with you. And it's just, I don't know. They have such a responsibility while those kids as having a kid in high school, not at Malden, but having kids in high school, I have that such a much responsibility for when those kids are there. And when they leave outside there, it's just hard to maintain that. It's a, you know, I believe Malden is the largest school in Greenville County. And so you've got a lot of kids. A lot of kids do not ride the bus anymore. A lot of people just, you know, their parents are picking them up. And, you know, I just seen the, the flux of kids in the past four to five years. Uh, 
you know, I would love for them to park over there, but I've got, we have got to worry about the senior adults that sure. is at. So uh, if it was a, if they would not speed and throw trash out and things like that, we wouldn't really have a problem. But those are the things that we're having. And I'm, you know, the seniors have complained about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Comlander, is the long-term uh, decision just to close those two entrances and force all traffic through the main entrance off Butler Road? We close all three entrances. Really? I was out there today, and I told the ladies that were on the playground if they needed to go out, that there was a staff member on the bottom end of, on corn to let them out. Uh, you know, there's a way to get out, but we'll always have a staff person. If we lock in that facility up, we're going to have a staff person there. And so, and I'm trying to address the situation so these, you know, these seniors won't come to y'all or whatever else or keep them from calling Mr. Duncan because he's got enough to, to handle. And so that's that's the reason why I'm shutting it down is, you know, and um, you know, Tass kind of been here a while and he can, and, and you as to Mr. Reynolds, uh, Mr. Matt, he's been here a while and, and it just, this has been a going ongoing issue for years and years. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know we've had this conversation before up here about about that. Um, um, and, I, and I can speak to, I know, Mr. Duncan, you and I talked about lining of the intersection there, and we're still waiting to hear from, back from SCDOT and whether or not we can get that lined. Well, even though that, that doesn't really address your problem because they don't even go up to walk across where they're supposed to walk anyways. Um, but I'm curious, uh, when you allocate somebody, a staff member there, how long are they out there doing that? We're locking up around three fifteen and opening up a little before four. And so we take turns. I may be up there one day. Willie may be up there one day. We just try not to have the same person out there, we try to rotate it. And, you know, yes, is that time taken away from something else to answer your question? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, oh, we had a person that we had it blocked on Butler today and they jumped the curb. There's two dogs that are bar that are buried in that park. They're CNI dogs and they ran all over their grave today. I, uh, a coach was out there with a son, text me. I wasn't there. I was there earlier and then I left. But text me and said they jumped the curb and ran over um, those graves because there's two dogs parked there, uh, buried there. So, um, you know. I, I get it, you know. I, I don't, you know. I, I you try to, and we try to do that just on Mondays and Wednesdays, and Fridays, because that's our big days. We have pickleball on Fridays there, and it's that parking lot is full just with the senior adults, and they're just trying to get out of there in time. But people start lining up over there, three thirty, three twenty. At the Dollar General, they close their parking lot down. The fruit stand. Uh, Miss Chandler, she doesn't let them park in there, and it's just been, uh, it's just been going on ongoing problem with the people that are neighbors to the high school. And, I, and part of me was like, well, we could put some kind of median, but the buses need it because they maybe I got to get out, they got to turn left all the time. Right, and they, you have cars that will pull in front of where the buses are supposed to turn, and I just sit there and watch, and it's just. <laughs> It's just a lot of people trying to get in one spot. Oh. Yep. There was a woman who hit my son on her on his way to high school right in that area because she was trying to get around. Yes. Um, so I don't have any uh, great solutions for you. I think what you're doing right now, continue to do it. Um, there might be some additional signage things that we could do. But aside from that, I don't really think there's a lot outside of what – Mr. Reynolds suggested, which is to close down those two permanently, uh, that might alleviate some of it. Um, the other question that I did have for you, though, is you mentioned the RFQ is out for the um, the multi-purpose uh, outdoor court area. Um, last time, I think you said you didn't get any response to the RFQs. Were, are you taking another step? Well, we didn't. We didn't have it out for bid. We were calling some folks. They would come out there and they would ever email me back for a price. So we're going to try this. And so what we're going to do is um, tackle it maybe all in one because there's part of that is the walking trail. Uh, it's not 
one part did not get uh, paid the last time we did that project. We're trying to complete it uh, as well. So it's all going to be kind of bundled up in one. Okay. The only other thing that comes to my mind that we could look into, which I'm not necessarily saying we should, would be to actually fence in the park completely. That's something we can look at. And so that's your, uh, the question I learned this as well. Uh, when you when you lay asphalt, it takes about a year for it to cure. And so uh, the two basketball courts are at Springfield and at Sunset. Those were already existing being there. And so you can lay over and put the surface, paint the surface back over it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has to cure about a, a good year. That's when the asphalt guy told me before you do, it would, you know, put your, you know, to paint it. And uh, I, I had the idea of just painting it because it makes it pop. I mean, the, if you look at Pine Forest and even Springfield, that it really makes it look good. And so, um, but we'll we'll figure that out. We're going to put some lines there and make it work for now. So, okay. All right. If there's no other questions there, uh, we have no unfinished business. We have new business, and this is Pine Forest Park. So, Bart, I'll let you take that as well. Uh, looking over to Seth to say, Seth, hey, it's your job. Either one. You go ahead, and I'm going to add if you want me to. Okay. We'll, we'll tag team it. How about that? Uh, so tonight we have a request to approve a grant modification through the South Carolina uh, Parks, Recreation, Tourism Department, which would amend our grant for Pine Forest Park. We have received that grant actually several years ago and had some initial plans. Uh, those plans uh, did not seem to, to be able to move forward for, for various reasons. And so we recently, in going back to PARD, asked for... Um, the, uh, for our grant modification, and as we were examining what to do out there at that park, we had some feedback from neighbors. They either came in and spoke here in council chambers, or they called uh, Mr. Cumberlander and expressed their desires for what they would like to see out there. And so in looking at or, or listening to those comments and looking at what uh, is possible out there, uh, the, the team came up with a new plan um, to, to create some uh, new opportunities out there, some safety improvements, and uh, a little bit more. Mr. Cumberland, do you want to talk about it real quick? You mean flip to the... Uh, you can. So one thing is, too, is Seth's talking about is the expansion of the parking lot. There's only, I think, three spots out there and a handicapped spot out there now. And so trying to uh, widen that because if you do have some folks um just in the neighborhood they will drive they, if they're in the back part of the neighborhood they're going to probably drive the car up there or walk um that's kind of a hidden jewel that park there's not a whole lot of people but it is a whole lot of people so three spots really is we want to try to get it a little bit bigger we want to seal coat that walking trail that you see uh in front of you we want to seal coat that and just kind of dress it up a little bit as well uh there are some routes that are exposed into the playground area, but we can uh, talk to public works and we're going to try to work that out and get those kind of out of there. And then, uh, you know, and put a fence uh, around that just because of that traffic. You have speed bumps uh, up there now on that road right adjacent to the park there. And so uh, we're just having safety, extra safety precaution is just have a fence around there because, um, you know, if they were anything like my little one, they'd be gone in five minutes and you're or five seconds and you're trying to chase them. So that's just another safety precaution that we're trying to do there as well. Uh, and it's a few picnic tables. There are, are uh, some existing picnic tables that are out there now that I believe a Boy Scout uh, built uh, numerous years ago. And so we just want to try to have something a little bit nicer and sturdy and safe for people to go out there and maybe just have a lunch or a dinner or whatever. And, Enjoy the kid while they play on the playground. Very good. And and from the last meeting we had, we are saving the trees. The, the, all the trees will be saved. And actually on the, the right side of the project uh, map there, we'll be adding seven trees. Uh, so there'll be no loss in trees. Um, and we're actually adding to the tree count out there. Excellent. All right. That's a pleasure of committee. Chairman, I'd like, Mr. Chairman, yes. I'd like to make a motion to afford to full council with a recommendation of approval, the modification of the PARD grant. 
for the modification of Pine Forest Park. Okay, I have a motion. Is there a second? Okay. Here is a second. Is there any further discussion? <laughs> Mr. Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a comment on love the plan, love the fence, um, added trash cans, and seal coating the um, trail. The small shelter, I don't know the definition of small shelter, but as big of a small shelter as you get can get would be great over there. I think that's, um, I know I've seen several families doing pop-up tents and sitting out and having barbecues, et cetera. So something that could accommodate that, I think would would be a wonderful addition to that park. Um, and just as a side note, Mr. Chairman, this grant is for a, a sh the PARD grant is a shared amount at the amount of $49,241.16. Uh, the share amount for the state is $39,392.93, which has the city's share at only $9,848.23. So that's just for information. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. I would just like to say as the uh, resident tree hugger in the room that I'm pleased to see that the trees weren't taken down and we actually added some. So thank you. So noted. All right. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 The ayes have it. Up next is the second public comment. Unless there's anything else, Mr. Conalander. No, sir. All right. Second public comment. Is anyone here? Public comment? No. All right. So that leads us to committee concerns. Are there any concerns? No, Mr. Chairman. What do we say on adjournment? Motion to adjourn. I hear a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. I hear a second. Any discussions? Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned at 659. Next committee meeting is going to be building in codes. What? Maybe they'll email you instead of me. All right, I will call to order uh, the Building and Codes Committee meeting at 6.59 p.m. in attendance. Mr. Allgood, Mr. Matney, Mr. Duncan, uh, and Ms. Miller, and various staff, Mr. Deerhog. <clears throat> uh, first order of business is public comment for anything on our agenda today. Do I have public comment? State your name and address, sir. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Stuart Wyeth. I'm part of the ownership group for 110 North Main Street, the former BB&T here in Greenville. I just wanted to say thank you again for the opportunity to continue to invest in Malden. We're excited about our project opportunity, which is on the agenda this evening. Two items I would point out to you related to that are uh, comments around queuing and comments about isolating traffic flow from Jenkins Court. Uh, we have done both of those by providing ample queuing uh, for the drive through proposed drive through and isolated the queuing area from any cross traffic into the future of Jenkins Court. Um, Mr. Garcia is here with me, um, who I believe you've heard from before, who's the owner of Summer Moon Coffee. And uh, if there's any comment, questions, or uh, opportunity for us to speak to that, we're more than happy to help. So thank you again. No other comment. All right. Reading and approval of minutes. Motion for to approve approval. Present. Uh, second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Approved. All right. Moving on. Reports and communications. Mr. Deerhog. Good evening, committee members, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on our report for our department, just a, two really brief items. I want to make you aware that we have issued uh, permits for the second phase of Parkside at Butler, which is an affordable housing apartment community out on East Butler Road. They'll have 80 units that are part of this second phase. We're 
eager for that project. And the second item I'll note to you is that we have issued uh, some additional licenses and seen more businesses continue to open at Bridgeway Station, including Cocoa Bowls and the City Market, which is a food hall court. Um, aside from our general monthly update too, I wanna to make you aware that we have uh, added a, a building inspector to our staff recently. And I just wanted to review with you um, why we've done that. We were going through the process and preparing for the upcoming budget and recognized that we were blowing through our inspection line item as it relates to the third party that we contract out to support us with building inspections and realized that there would be an opportunity for um, some substantial savings if we were to just have our own employee do inspections. You might recall, we actually made a similar maneuver at uh, during the fall of last year to build, bring in a building inspector again to help control the costs that we were just shelling out for building inspections. We started out with $150,000 budgeted for this year for building inspections. We are currently at 93,000 and change through January um, when we went back and amended the budget last year, we were probably trending or tracking at that point to be at about $250,000 in our expenditures for city inspect or building inspections. So that helped when we made that maneuver last year. Um, this year, we had the opportunity to help some more. The next slide on here just shows how we compare with having our own inspector versus using the third party. We stand to save over $13,000 for just the remainder of this fiscal year by having our own employee. And um, for the sake of a full year, we would save over $50,000 to the city's budget. Um, there's some other factors that went into this decision as well. Um, we have heard over the years how hard it is to find building inspectors and hire building inspectors, including for our third party company that we use. We had a lead on, on a really great inspector who was in the midst of looking for an opportunity. We had a very small window to attract him to Malden, which we were successful in doing. So wanted to give you that update tonight um, that uh, just to let you know that in, in consultation with the city administrator, we had added an inspector to our staff. That's the report I have for you tonight. If there's any questions, I'm glad to take those. David, would you speak on also on the um, fact that it will increase our customer service and our ability to, to offer inspections? Yes, we are. You've seen the charts and seen the data as far as the number of permits and inspections, how it's just continuing to rise. So we have this is an added measure too to just help us to meet the demand of what we're receiving from builders and other parties who need inspections and um, have been really bottleneck at points at, at points in time because of our inability to give them as many inspections as they would like to have. So this is helping with that while also severing our dependence on our CI. Um, and plus it's nice to be able to have your own inspector that you get to choose instead of getting the inspectors that are assigned to you. Some are good and some are not so good. Questions for Mr. Deerhog? Mr. Matt. Mr. Deerhog, now that we have, uh, and congratulations for getting a new uh, building inspector on staff. Um, how long, because we, we need to plan for the future. How long will it be before we either need to add another building inspector on top of the one that you just hired or start reliance again on a third party RCI or otherwise. So we have been trying to forecast what we anticipate doing on an annual basis for permits and inspections. And with the staff that we'll have with the building official returning soon, we will be set up success for as much as we can see into the foreseeable future as far as the development projects that we're aware of either that are currently building or will be building in the next couple of years. So we expect to be good. And, and they'll be able to have a, a strong turnaround for 
permit reviews? Yeah, we actually offer the best around right now. There's not much any, there's hardly any other places where you can call and request an inspection the next day. We are still offering that service and our plan reviews are usually within the realm of a week, no more than two weeks, which is again, best around. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No other comments or questions. Uh, we can move on to unfinished business. And we have the amendment section 5616, the Baldwin zoning ordinance regarding the drive through facility in our central redevelopment district. I don't have too much more to add on this. We've talked about it a couple of times now, but I will update you to let you know that the Planning Commission reviewed this last week, held a public hearing. Um, there was no opposition at the hearing and the Planning Commission voted seven to zero to recommend approval of the ordinance. And just to refresh you briefly, what we've done with this ordinance is try to take as minimal uh, effect as we can on on drive-throughs within the central redevelopment district. And really, when you look at the ordinance that you're reviewing tonight, uh, it's it's a modification of how we grandfather in some past drive-throughs. And that's essentially what you're reviewing. I will update you one other thing too. The city attorney was able to review this ordinance, um, unfortunately not in time for the planning commission meeting, but I got some comments from him tonight. He just has some very slight minor rewording to close a, uh, a loop, if you will, to the ordinance when this, if this comes to council, we'll include that. But basically it's um, his revision is in the first line of the actual ordinance language that new drive-through facilities are allowed within this district in the following limited circumstances. You'll see in your packets, the way it's worded is that they are generally prohibited. So he's kind of closed that loop a little bit to say, nope, this is, when it's permitted, that's it. Comments, questions? It's the yes for the committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and I, I honestly don't know how I'm going to vote on it when it gets to full council um, because I am going back and forth with it in my head. Uh, but I think that since it's gone through legal review with the Planning Commission, uh, having supported it unanimously that at the very least um, we, uh, the rest of council needs to weigh in uh, on on this ordinance. So uh, I move that we forward to full council. Motion to forward to full council. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. On to new business. What kind of business today? All right, I'm going to lump the next two together because they go together. Um, we have two properties that have requested annexation into the city. This includes 325 and 315 Bridges Road. Um, primarily, this is being driven to correct a illegal tap into the small and sewer line. And um, the, the new homeowner at 315 Bridges Road came upon this, discovered that by some previous owners, they had been tapped on, were unaware of that. In fact, when they bought the home, they were expected that they had a good working septic system in the, in the yard, only to find out that it was not in operation. So anyways, here we are. They wanna get this resolved and corrected and be into the city so they can continue to um, use the sewer that they're already tapped into. Questions, comments? Uh, the, the only question I had is uh, obviously we're addressing 325 and 315, but what about 319 up front? Is there any issue with them or are they? No issue that we know of and they have not requested that one be annexed. It, and in fact, 325 and 319 are owned by the same, but uh, they have, elected to annex 325 because I believe they're actually going to try to sell the property um, and just went, went and didn't run a, want to run into any issues with sewer connections as it relates to that property. But 319 sounds like they're good on. My, my question is about um, 
more around the, the the zoning that's that's being proposed because I know that's different than you know one of the notes you make here is it's different than what the comprehensive plan has, and I know we've kind of at least in my short very short tenure here on council we've been talking a lot about and concerned about making sure that our zoning fits. Yeah, the main reason really that we selected the R15 zoning for their petition was because it matches what's across the street on Bridges Road. And uh, it's consistent with the developed character of that area. And it's consistent with how the properties are already developed. So I know our comprehensive plan called for a higher density uh, designation there, um, but it seems like this is the the path that would least tip the cart okay because yeah, i know my question was the you know with the proximity to bridgeway there you know, are we limiting ourselves in the future are we are we, are we in some way kicking the can no i uh, yeah i i hear where you're coming from the the homeowner there has no interest though in seeing their property redevelop for townhomes or anything more than that they don't but you just said they're selling so well the other homeowner may at some point but we'd probably all feel more comfortable if we review the rezoning with that knowing what might be coming or giving them a blink check okay you have a motion moving forward to full council both uh, both properties second Any discussion Um, really just, I, I want to cover something that Mr. Fleeman didn't cover, uh, during his presentation in public works, but last Thursday, governor McMaster, uh, signed into law legislation that names the first Monday in March, uh, as water professionals day in South Carolina. So that is for drinking water. That is for wastewater. That is for storm water. That is for all of the people that we have, uh, here in the city and in governmental agencies across the state to make sure that water goes where it's supposed to go, when it's supposed to go. Uh, and this is a prime example of uh, folks not knowing where their wastewater um, has gone, and they only make that phone call when, when there's a problem. So um, you know, I, I don't have a problem with this. I just want to uh, wish all of uh, our folks that deal with sewer here in Malden uh, happy first Water Professionals Day. Oh, well, so, Mr. Matty, well said. Thank you. All right, have a motion to forward to council with a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Then we will move it along. All right, our next order of business is the institutional uses of S1, I1 zoning districts. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So we've put this on the agenda tonight because um, we recognize that we have some very important industrial and uh, commercial business areas in the city that contribute much to the health and the vitality of the community. And um, some of these include at Brook, Brookfield Office Park, Old Stage Road, um, and, and others. We are starting to see a little bit interest from institutional uses moving into some spaces in these areas as they open up and become vacant. In fact, we've recently over the last year or so had two new schools move into Brook, the Brookfield Office Park. And uh, it, it changes uh, di the dynamic of a few things, including the opportunities for revenue that the city has received and relied on to help support the community and, and all the things that the city offers. So I've put this on the agenda tonight to see if this is of anything of interest to, to go back and review how we allow and if we allow institutional uses in some of these more critical employment areas. If this is something that's of interest in the committee, we can take this up with the planning commission and have them work on an ordinance that we'll present back to you at a future date. So just looking for your feedback, if there's any interest in this. Do we have any feedback? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually think it's a, an extremely timely issue. As Mr. Deerhog mentioned, um, we've had uh, some schools move into Brookfield and we've seen that institutional interest. And um, I, I think what happens as more of that interest presents itself is that we lose uh, potential economic development opportunities. Um, I think that continuing to allow that makes JR's job 
uh, more difficult as our community development and economic development director. Uh, and, and we need to go ahead and close what is essentially a loophole so that the businesses that are going into those areas are the businesses that those areas are designed for in the first place. Uh, and we're just going to continue losing opportunities if we allow that loophole to, to stay open. So I appreciate Mr. Deerhog and uh, coming to, to this committee tonight and, and asking for input. So I, I would say yes. I, I, I take it that no one has come to you yet to put a cemetery in Brookfield. Uh, yeah, <laughs> there are a couple of open uh, lots there. Uh -huh. <laughs> So the fact that cemetery is one of the ones that falls in S1, along with uh, daycare centers, funeral homes, assisted living, nursing homes, hospitals, outpatient healthcare, churches, colleges, universities, grade schools, social assistance services, as you listed here, just so I read them off so that folks here could hear that list. Yes, I, I, I agree with Mr. Matney. I believe that overall, we're, we're talking a lot about our comprehensive plan. We're talking about a strategic plan. We're talking about how do we get better at zoning here in the city. So I think this falls right into that mix. Thanks, sir. Uh, I, I do have a question. Can you, I, I know we had some sort of number. Did we ever get a final number on what the impact was going to be on our tax roll with the, uh, with the school that is going in there now? Did we, did we come up with that number? Yeah, I had that number, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. Maybe Mr. Duncan, do you remember? The figure I remember off the top of my head was a $50,000 loss in property tax revenue. Should they be successful in getting that um, abated because of the nonprofit status? Right. And do we know how long that lease is for that's been signed with them? I believe it is 10. It's 10. That, that feels right. With an option. Think to renew after that. Yeah. Thank you. If I may, can I ask Mr. Charles a question? Hey, um, I'm curious. Uh, based on the conversation we're having right now, where we're talking about availability of space, are you running into any challenges or issues with what you're seeing on the economic development front in terms of of interest in any of our properties? So with Brookfield, specifically Brookfield, the um, there's not a lot of interest and demand. Just put it up that way. There are price points in that park that make it a challenge to locate tenants in there. There are some expectations of users that go in there. So for Brookfield specifically, no, from that side of it. The other legacy challenges that we have are in the expectations of property owners to have a certain price point. And I'm thinking not Brookfield, but everywhere. Just just general interest in, in, in prices just being higher than what market will bear in that piece of it. Um, there are a lot of other environmental challenges. We have a lot of um, gas stations, for example, that still have tanks in the ground, and so no one wants to assume the liability of them, laundromats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, while we do have interest in some redevelopment, it's not as, I'm trying to think of a polite way to say this, there are unnatural restrictions or inhibitions that are preventing people from coming into things mostly mostly related to market forces that are price sensitive thank you mr chairman yes sir let me, i just want to piggyback off that a little bit so as we see nationally the the office market is changing dramatically sure. there's a lot of of vacant office space out there um however uh you know, when it comes to these types of employment centers that have been specifically set aside, even in Brookfield, they had to change their covenants to allow an institutional, institutional use to go in. And so for us, it's a, a preservation of potential economic development employment centers, but also we want to be uh, cognizant of the fact that, and for that last one uh, that's moving in, they're going to be tearing up a portion of the parking lot to create a playground. And so it's really changing fundamentally the character of the, the zoning classification classification that that currently is. So that was some of the reasons why we felt it was appropriate to at least bring it to committee to get feedback here. Um, but we do recognize that there is a vacancy rate out, uh, issue out there uh, and we are working to help uh, create potentially incentives that could help them to be more competitive uh, as they are uh, seeking uh, new tenants, especially in the biomedical field and some of the other fields that are in 
um, that are being targeted by several different economic development functions uh, throughout the region. Thank you. Yeah, and I think the the other issue that I didn't bring up that, that concerns me, especially with these, um, you know, we heard in uh, we heard in our rec report with you know how schools create uh, challenges with traffic. As well, I think that's another thing that's a the concern of mine too. That these 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 facilities weren't built with that necessarily in mind. And I don't I don't know anyone that lives in Malden that doesn't like to complain about the traffic, including yours truly. So. Anyway, so I don't know that we have a vote. I think do we we just need to. No, I think we'll what we'll do is we'll just we'll draft. Uh, David, how do you want to proceed with that? Would you? Yeah. Yeah, there's no vote necessary tonight. We'll go ahead and take this up with the planning commission. Okay. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. All right, we are to our second uh, public comment. We want to have public comment? Yes, sir. Please state your name and address. Uh, George Dowling, 204 Fieldgate Court, Planters Row, HOA President. Uh, to stem off the last conversation, I am a working member of the Brookwood Parkway. Traffic hasn't been as bad as it can be, but it is a posted 25 mile per hour zone. And there are a lot of people that use it as a cut through to get over, I guess, over to the other side near Wendy's, et cetera, on Garlington, or sorry, on uh, Feaster. Um, I'm worried about the kids. There's also, you know, a lot of geese and stuff in the area, but um, I don't know if it's appropriate signage or something else might need to be posted up there because you do have a, now a mixed breed of different people, one slowing down and other speeding through. Uh, the nature of my speaking today, um, it has brought to our attention, our neighborhood's attention, that we do have, um, I guess, a code question. Uh, we have found that we have at least one Airbnb type rental property at 6 Beth Glen Court. Um, per the code, as I remember reading it, Malden has if you will, put something on the books, but with no teeth. So basically it says it's up to the HOAs to decide if they are allowable or not. In our situation, no rental such property is allowed um, for temporary gain. So since there's nothing else on the Malden, we're trying to understand or figure out what we should do in the purpose of having to enforce it within our own guidelines, or is there something else that we need to take up with Malden to start it there since we don't want to supersede what Malden might do? Sure, thank you. Um, I think as stated before, it's not a opportunity for us to go back and forth, but we'll definitely pass that along to uh, staff and we can talk afterward. Thank you. Any other public comment? Committee concerns? Okay. What do I hear on adjournment? So moved. Second. Discussion about that? No. Nope. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. We are adjourned at 725. It's just over. Who sets the who sets the order? You set the order. I don't have to get up. I have to get up once. But can we sit down? <laughs> you're sick. I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I got it. I'm not. But as for tonight. All right, going to go ahead and call EPD to order at 725. Everybody's here who ought to be here, and that's going to take us to our first public comment period. Hearing none, what do I hear on reading and approval of minutes? Uh, motion to approve. Second. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Minutes are approved as presented. Mr. Charles. Hello again. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, updates about economic development activity for the department. I'll start off with econ dev and we'll move to uh, cultural center. So city center update, first layer of asphalt has been laid down on Jenkins street. You probably saw the picture in our administrator's report. Binding comes next, then we'll get down the hard surfaces. Uh, Duke energy has obtained the easements from Aldi and advanced auto. That was the linchpin to do the conversion. Uh, so those were the major properties that were uh, accessed. Uh, we have one property owner who has not agreed to an easement that is needed for this conversion, and I'm meeting with them after I uh, receive documentation from Daniel uh, Hughes that we can go ahead and present an offer, uh, an expectation of cooperation, hopefully. And then the Maverick ta uh, Yards townhomes are expected to begin going vertical in construction this April. So 
uh, about a month and some change before they go vertical um, from that. I have Brookfield Office Park on my notes here. Uh, David and I met with their POA reps. Trinity Partners are the POA managers. They're looking for ways to try to market themselves as to that of individual owners with individual reps trying to do something as a block unit. So it speaks to a little bit of what we talked about before about how these individual building owners, when they're represented by CBRE or Cushman Wakefield or Creative Builders, whoever, they're all doing their own little thing. And so we met with them to try to think of some ways we could bring them together. Some other things they asked for were things such as, is it possible to get a bus route that runs through Brookfield so we can get transit running through there? Is there a way to do uh, electric car charging uh, on the site? And there are incentives to do that. So we're trying to work them on some creative solutions that will draw more interest. Because when site selectors ask for information related to um, office or industrial availability, they have this tally of about 350 questions. And it's things on there like, do you have a transit system? Do you have electric car charging? Do you have public parts amenities? Do you have so many daycares within a five mile radius? Do they have empty slots? And it's just on and on and on. So we're going to work with them on trying to identify the ways that we can address pain points that are maybe, as I mentioned earlier, unnatural or unrealistic. Those are some of the things that speak to it a little bit. So anyway, to be continued, uh, the POA is having their meeting on the 27th of this month. And so I've given some topics back to their managers to say, here's some of the things we can talk about if we're getting to a more formalized discussion. That's Brookfield Office Park. Uh, Bridgeway, uh, we all saw the good news on Friday to Bridgeway Brewing have the ribbon cutting. City Market Foo Hall is up and running and their ribbon cutting will be on April 27th, which is the same day as Bridgeway's uh, grand opening celebration. So hooray on that. Uh, to the cultural center. Well, let me stop right there. Anything on economic development before we move on to cultural center? Okay. Cultural center uh, for theater programming, high school musical junior starts this Friday. First, uh, tickets are available now. We've had a pretty heavy marketing push that has just kicked off, but the first show is already 50% sold out. As the word of mouth gets out, as the social media gets out, it'll start to go up. So if you like tickets, please let me know. There's an employee discount uh, for city mall employees and uh, we can accommodate you as we need to. Uh, I'll bring this up again next month for, but food for thought is that our Malden Blues and Jazz Festival is April the 20th, 2 p.m. to 9 p.m. The main acts are John Neesmith, Mac Arnold, the Greenville Jazz Collective, and Kylie Odetta. We will have a side stage this year, getting bigger, uh, for local jazz bands. So think of like Malden High School. Uh, we're trying to nail down the particulars and get them booked, but um, we're trying to get that. So that will be finalized hopefully in the next couple of weeks. As far as vendors, we'll have 12 food trucks, two beer trucks, helps on that line that uh, everyone's concerned about. And then there will be activities uh, for kids on the side lawn from there. And then into programming, uh, summer camps have begun marketing. And within the first week of registration, 50% of the slots were sold. Definitely have some good demand on that market. Numbers are still going up from there. And then I was sitting in the back and pulled out my Sharpie and have bonus, so bonus section. So any other questions about M Cultural Center? Okay. Mural, uh, you approved the mural design uh, a couple of months ago. Installation is scheduled for the last week of March, first week of April. We'll get that note out whenever we get that word back from Art House about that. And then we have RFPs that have been issued for exterior lighting and interior uh, uh, building security. Those RFPs are coming back on March the 11th. And then with the front steps, we've gotten back engineered drawings on that, and we plan to release the RFP in the next week or two. Uh, we have to answer some questions that the engineer gave to us, but that is coming out soon. So hopefully we get safety and security at the cultural center identified. And that is a quick summary of what's Mr. Charles, would you uh, share the good news about the steps, please? The good the, news? The, the new design of the steps. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I was going to make sure you heard that, Ms. King. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I am. <laughs> he, okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, sorry. You've been busy. Uh, so the designed look of the steps will stay consistent with what is out there now. So the whole idea is retain both the wing walls and then just reform the steps uh, and not to change the look at all. Yes. So the engineer drawn show that will the, the steps will be a foot in depth and one inch high. So they give plenty of steps up so that uh, as we talked about there, people with bad knees uh, can get up the steps uh, on that side. So yes, Seth, thank you for the reminder. Always look at me when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also in the bad knees category these days. So I will be thankful when I go up the steps too. Anything for JR? Mr. Kralin. Just had a question. Somebody, uh, somebody had asked me, um, has there been any movement as far as any development for the um, 
building that was burned down that had Club Epic. Are they doing anything that you're aware of? Uh, that's more of a David question from a permitting standpoint, but to my knowledge, unless these come to any else. business stuff for. Uh, so I can share that they are still working with the insurance company uh, to look at their options and that um, we've not received any permit requests so uh, with drawings as of yet. Anything else from Mr. Charles? All right, then we don't have any unfinished business. Let's move on to the city center master plan. Yes, as you will recall, uh, we were uh, successful in our application for the municipal association for a uh, hometown economic development grant. And we, uh, we issued an RFP uh, for a consultant to uh, bid on. And we had uh, three submittals, and then we have one that we've negotiated, two we negotiated with, and one now that we're recommending. I'm gonna go back through here. The recommendation from staff is that Seaman Whiteside is selected as the consultant to create that city center master plan. Simple on that. And and, and I'll say, um, Seaman Whiteside already has, is already familiar with city center village. They've looked at us um previously as other iterations but um no, I'm, I'm i'm glad to see them come back in um any questions for mr charles before we get into discussion curious who the other two were uh, the other two that bid uh was uh agora partners which is the uh, partnership between agora and kimley horn and the other one was mrb group anything else for mr charles I'd like to make a motion to forward the uh, contract with Seaman Whiteside, the creation of the city center village master plan to full council. Is there a second? There a second. Is there a discussion? Hearing, hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. We're going to forward that to full council. Public comment part two. Committee concerns. That leaves one more piece of business. Motion to adjourn. Second. Discussion. Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. We are adjourned at 734. Tell me very soon. I will know. I will put it down. On that so perfectly. Uh, uh, somebody's been texting me. <laughs> okay. Oh, cool. Thank you. All right. I will call our final and best committee meeting to order um, public safety. It is 7.35 p.m. Present are all members of committee, myself, Mr. Allgood, Mr. Kraling, um, as well as um, our city staff, chiefs, and clerk of court. Next, we'll have public comment. Anyone have a public comment for this first go around? Please state your name and address for the record. Uh, Mark Steenbeck, 24 Trail Stream Drive, 29662. Um, I just wanted to um, make a, a comment on uh, as far as the discussion for the no parking regulations. Uh, as uh, late as this evening on my way home to drop off my 13-year-old before rushing back over here, um, uh, I was once again forced to the middle of the road uh, because I had cars on both sides of me and I had a car coming down the hill at me um, and pretty sure at a higher rate of speed than he should have been for the neighborhood. 
Um, but really, uh, this is an experience that I have multiple times a week. Uh, my other concern is with these uh, tunnels that these cars create. Um, I have four young boys. Uh, they do use the sidewalk. Unfortunately for me, the sidewalk is on the other side of the road. So they cross the road to use the sidewalk like fine, upstanding young men that they are occasionally. Um, and then they go down the road and cross the road again. Um, and again, the, you know, it creates these blind spots. Uh, it, we've had issues I, I, this past Thursday. Uh, I ended up having to back up to let a, a, a school bus through. Um, and it's just an ongoing issue. Not sure exactly what the, uh, what the opportunities are there, but just wanted to express the, the consistent experience that I've had with that issue. Thank you. Yes, sir. Please. Just state your name and address, please. Ken Heiser, 316 Nantala Trail. I'm on the HOA board at the towns at Whispering Meadows. Uh, we've sent you a letter, but I was also just going to highlight a couple points from that. Um, the development was platted with very narrow streets, and particularly, so you sort of have to play, if cars are parked on both sides, you have to play a pinball trying to do dodge down. There's a long curve. If the cars are on both sides there, it becomes very challenging. In January, we got a, a letter from Mr. Fleeman saying that Public Works was having trouble picking up trash in our neighborhood because their trucks cannot access, and requested that the HOA take action to prevent parking on the streets on trash days. Now, the problem is if a trash truck can't get down there, your fire and emergency trucks can't get down there at any time at all. Um, our developer provided CCNRs, provide no, vision for the HOA to control on-street parking. And I've heard lots of different legal opinions whether an HOA in South Carolina or in our city is allowed to control parking on public streets. Um, and we have taken action. We, we have sent a letter to every one of our owners and asked them to um, park, park on one side of the street voluntarily. That's had a little bit of luck, but even since then, we've still had several reports of uh, owners that can't get their trash picked up because the trash truck cannot get to them. There was a park, it looked like a parking area that actually was platted out as a turnaround zone, had never been marked. Public Works did mark that correctly as a no parking area, so at least they have a turnaround spot for the truck. And so we do request, to, we've in our letter request to, uh, specific sides of the streets be designated as no parking. It's not an easy decision for an area that's very parking challenged. The towns was not platted out with really any parking at all, uh, visitor parking or extra parking beyond the one in the garage and the one in the driveway. And we know people have lots of cars. Um, but at this point, the HOA doesn't see another solution to maintain the trash truck access on, on trash day and particularly emergency vehicle access on any days. Thank you. George Dowling, 204 Fieldgate Court, Planters Row HOA president. Uh, agree with everything he just said. Um, we have had problems with parking on the street. It is in the CCNRs from our HOA. I think the developer copy and paste it as they build all the neighborhoods, so we all have the same problem. Um, the rules say that there's no parking allowed, but we're toothless in trying to enforce it because the jurisdiction of the road is Malden. Um, some of the problems that we do have is permanent parking on the street wrong way parking on the street, neither are being enforced or ticketed as we can tell because we have some cars that have been there for quite a while. Additionally, uh, we did meet um, probably about two years back. Um, there was a safety uh, police officer that was supposed to be set aside for liaison liaisoning between the neighborhoods, but we haven't really seen him since. And that I thought was a great opportunity for us to work to possibly help deal with some of these type issues. Um, to get it done, but we it's still at the end of the day, we still need to try to solve this problem because it is a problem. Um, the other problem that we have is at least in Planters Row is we have a lot of roads that chicane back and forth and visibility is really tough. So if there's anyone out in their yard playing, whether it be sidewalk side or not, um, you can't see the kids until you're past them and speeding or any other thing could cause a problem. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, we'll have a second opportunity at the end of the meeting. So we'll move on to the reading and approval of the minutes from January the 2nd. Motion to approve as submitted. Second. I have a motion and a second. Are there any corrections or further discussion? Hearing none, seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes from January the 2nd say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously.
All right, Chief McCone, you're up first tonight. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. We'll give you all some quick updates. And the million dollar question, we are in our station. <clears throat> so we finally got everybody moved in. And a and nice new shirt. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I figured tabs were going to I like down. that. But we all got moved in, and we're still planning on doing our hose coupling ceremony probably, probably about mid April because we got a few pieces of equipment we're still waiting on to come in so we can get them installed and all that. Also, the two QRVs, medical QRVs, have been ordered. So they'll be in any time now. And we've actually installed two generators where we was going to install one generator. Staff done their due diligence and actually got both of them for under what we was just or just a little bit over, but we've got it budgeted through the state appropriated funds. So awesome. now they'll actually be able to uh emergency generator operate everything in the stations. We're currently only certain pieces part of the station would operational. So that's good news. Yes. And I think that was it. All right. Any questions for Chief? Questions. Congratulations. Thank you. Post April 15th would be a perfect day. <laughs> Post April 15th? Yes. I'll write that. Our birthday's the 17th, so we'll see. All right. We might know to that. Usually it's a budget meeting that night, so I'm not sure what day that's on. See? See? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Our clerk of court, Mr. Rado. Seems like it's been a year since I've seen you, but it's just been a couple of months. <laughs> Madam Chair, Madam, uh, members of the committee, just a couple quick updates um, since the last time I was here. Um, we did complete the task of getting all the bond judges set up um, with their fillable bond forms. So what we did was um, we had taken all the um, standard approved forms that are court administration um, forms. We gave each judge like a digital file basically with all their specific forms. So whenever they go do a bond hearing, they can go in and just pick and choose whichever ones are applicable. Um, there's this fill form, so they just fill out all the defendants and court information once. It puts it all to the applicable fill forms, and they can print them out. So it's been a um, pretty good system, I think. Everyone's kind of on the whole standard forms. Everybody, it's a lot less um, room for error where you're constantly pulling forms and, you know, handwriting them. So hopefully that'll make it a little bit easier. Um, I did have the opportunity um, during the most recent um, county magistrate quarterly judge meeting. I was asked to do um, just a little write-up on Malden and kind of talk to the magistrate municipal judges in the county and basically like a day in the life of Malden. So I was able to go and kind of tell them the things we do and, um, and how we process um, things in our courtroom. So I think that worked well and I think it was received really well. Um, the last thing, um, just want to let you all know that um, so the court, we always um, were doing diversion programs through the county. Um, we had been doing um, pre-trial intervention program. We implemented the traffic education program. And now I've been working with the solicitor's office to implement the mental health referral program. So that's basically for defendants who um, are Greenville County residents. A lot of times meant the mental health system and the criminal justice system kind of cross paths and um, you're dealing with a lot of things at the same time. So this is a, a voluntary opportunity for people to get referred to the mental health court where they can receive treatment and counseling while also dealing with any um, pending city criminal charges. Um, so we're going to continue and work with them. There's no cost to the program for, for people. Um, it takes about a year for them to go through, but uh, hopefully it'll be a way for people to get it, um, access to some more resources. That's perfect. Any questions or comments? As always, thank you. You just amaze me every month with um, the progress that we're making um, in your department. So. Thank you. Well noted. Thank you. Chief Miller. Hey, Mr. Crook, Mr. Curley, Mr. All good. Good evening. I have a few things I was just going to uh, speak about. Uh, some of them were in the, the administrator's report. But our uh, explorers went to Winterfest in Tennessee. 
and they won third place in sale clearance. Also, second place in officer down in second in traffic stops. Uh, they've been stud uh, they've been practicing all year for this. We got some great advisors who's been helping them out, and we look forward to keep it to go next year as well. Uh, we had Coco with a cop at Malden Middle School last week, and also fist bump Friday at uh, Bethel Elementary. Uh, I was wanting to also highlight two officers, uh, Harley Grant. Uh, I was he pulled over a vehicle running at a high rate of speed through the city uh, one day, and it, uh, when he pulled the guy over, the guy had been shot in the leg outside the city, and he uh, the guy would have never made it to the hospital. He applied a tourniquet and saved his life. Uh, the same day, we had a domestic where uh, the lady was uh, forced to go, and Officer Kit listened to the radio and everything, listened to the descriptions, found the vehicle and uh, located the victim and got her back home. Uh, also, we have uh, we just received a shipment of vehicles, so we're we got uh, we just got eleven, well, 10, 10 patrol vehicles, one. Uh, grant vehicle and uh, one pickup truck for the, the liaison. Uh, and also, knock on wood, we've got two positions open. That's all we got. That's great. Department. And we've got stacks. We get applications in every day. So we're, we're doing pretty good right now. Excellent. And Margo turned two yesterday. I'm sorry. I, Did she I, get her Cheetos? I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> Well, I, I got her some popcorn one time. Okay. I threw up, so I can't get her popcorn anymore. So, uh, but that, that's all. sure. Um, that upstairs staff and that um, the finance wing took care of her. But yeah, she <laughs> knows what offices have. Uh huh. Snacks. Have treats, yes. Anything for Chief Miller? All right now, Officer Bonds. Yes. Is uh, he's been patiently waiting. Yes, and as soon as she gets done. Go ask her questions. She's got to be back in Columbia at ten o'clock. My ten o'clock, but she she's fine. And she just left Columbia at four, like fourish today. So, um. <laughs> Even Madam Chairman and members of the community, thank y'all for your time today. So, for reflecting on as a representative, representative as of the Malden Police Department, I want to reflect on the mission, the vision, and the values of which we stand for. So, within the mission of the Malden Police Department, we work cooperatively with the community. Our vision is to responsibility is the protection of our community through a guardian mindset and the heart of a servant. With our values, we have pride, professionalism, respect, integrity dedication, and excellence. Through all of the mission, the vision, and the values of the police department, I hold very near and dear to my heart, which brings me, sorry, we don't have a clicker tonight. <laughs> um, so um, I'm guessing y'all are wondering, like, who are you? Why are you up here? All of this and that. So my name is Claudia Bonds. I'm a police officer sworn in duty by the Malden Police Department. I'm newly positioned as an SRO, a school resource officer. And to those here tonight that do not know what an SRO is, which I did not know what an SRO was, or my responsibilities that I would obtain to this day um, that go pretty in depth. So an SRO is a sworn law enforcement officer assigned to one or more school districts in the state of South Carolina. Our primary duty is to act as a law enforcement officer for any and all crisis that occur inside the school or off with our with our juveniles that occur. This is my community. So within my community, I develop my training that I am equipped to detect and identify kids at risk. And my duty is to intervene and assess and apply resources. And when I say my community, I know some of us are thinking in the aspect of what would a road officer do? So a road officer, their community is the city. We're going down Bethel Drive all the way to East Butler, West Butler, across the city, and we're going into the suburbs and checking on residences, businesses, and all of that such. And for me, as my community, I'm going into the doors of Malden High School, or I'm going into the doors of the Golden Strip Career Center. Throughout the day, I rotate back and forth to these schools and when I walk through the streets of the hallways, 
I'm going to different suburbs inside the school. We have different cultural, ethnic, and races and languages throughout the high school and the career center. At the high school, we have upwards to almost 3,000 students, including students and faculty. And we have four, four stores, four stories, sorry, and a basement. So all day, you can imagine how busy we get. And then at the Career Center, I go to all different trades. I see kids that are in love with construction to HVAC to cosmetology, nail tech, and all the way down to fire and EMS. So throughout all of that, I'm dealt with a balancing act. Being an SRO, I'm aware of many hats. I'm a cop, a counselor, a mentor, an educator, and a familial friendly face to show a different side of law enforcement. In SRO world, we call it a triad. It's a triangle. We start with us as a law enforcement officer all the way to law-related counselor to a law-related educator. And as a law enforcement officer, I'm there to respond to any criminal things that occur that meet statute that I'm a mandated reporter of. As a law-related counselor, a kid that's having a very bad day that I know mom died last month, I know with my training and expertise to talk to this person and, and let them have a different kind of day than they would have without me there. And as a law-related educator, I'm there to educate the faculty and the students on criminal law to just random laws to educate them. And if they want to know anything of our decide, whether it be criminal or just what does a cop do, then that is what I'm there for. And as a counselor, as any, as an educator to a counselor, to a law enforcement officer, I take this triad and I do it as a positive role model, a resource to the community, and a positive liaison between the agency and the community. Because for me, that's my community. I'm out, as we describe, on an island. So we're out there and we're inside our communities and we're there securing the the safety and security of all of our students and faculty on a daily basis. So a little bit about me from the background of why I became an SRO, what brought me to where I am today and why all of this is near and dear to my heart. Growing up, I was adopted at birth. My I was adopted by my great grandparents. And so being raised by my great grandparents, you can imagine they weren't the youngest. So growing up, um, it turned into me raising them. It turned into me taking on the responsibility that a eight-year-old to a 17-year-old really wouldn't imagine to do. It began with me taking care of my parents in a role that I had no idea how to do. I was in high, I was in middle school to high school and I was truant. I was sometimes bullied. I was in school. I failed classes because I didn't have a study pattern. I didn't know the importance of school. I didn't know the importance of myself. The only thing I knew and what I still know that is important is a servant's heart. And with that servant's heart, my duty was to take care of my parents. And so growing up and taking care of them was my only worth, my only identity that I thought that I needed or had to do. And at the age of 15, after taking care of my nanny, I called him nanny and papa. So taking care of my nanny growing up, she fell ill and she died when I was 15. After she died, that hit pretty hard, went through a depressive episode, everything like that, that a 15 year old would never imagine to do. After that, I made it my sole duty to ensure this didn't happen to my papa. And so going through high school, I was passed to go to college for a full ride of, for softball. Did I think I would make it at college? No, because I had no study patterns. I did not know how to do school. I did not know how to do anything but take care of people. And so when I graduated high school, instead of going off to college, I knew I needed a check. I needed to make money so I could take care of my dad. So I joined the military. And when I went into the army, as I was, as I was closing out my training, uh, my dad felt ill, went on Red Cross leave, checked on him and everything, and made the decision with my chaplain that I would need to get out. 
So with that, we got out on a hardship and everything like that, and it took about two and a half months for me to get back home to my dad. And then that day that I got home to him, he passed away in his sleep that night. So he waited on me. And so after him passing away at the age of 17 years old, I didn't know my worth. I didn't know my identity. I only knew to care and serve for others. And I began at that point making decisions that steered me from creating my own identity, um, rather support others and help others reach their full potential. And in return, all those years wasted me away. But as I've came to create my own identi identity through my community, which is the people I work for, my church, my community, everyone, I have began to found my own passion and my journey with my worth, my purpose, and my identity. So with what I'm presenting today, the sole reason for this camp is to reach young girls prior to them entering the adult world and ensure that they know their worth, their identity in an uplifting, supportive manner. And with these girls, we'll be with them throughout their aging out, and, they, and we also have plans for an age out mentor program. And it's from an outside eye looking in on their life, and I want to ensure they have a community that supports and encourages their success in life personally and professionally. Serving at-risk youth. So what does this mean? You hear at risk a lot. So what makes this program different than other camps is that this camp focuses on developing the youth and engaging with them on a regular basis, meeting them at their lever level. This isn't a come be a cop camp. It's more of as an SRO, I have a duty to break the pipeline, which is a school to prison pipeline. So within that, with this camp is strategically developed to break barriers and build fundamentals to empower the youth. And so within empowering our youth, we will break these fundamentals. So to become a worthy leader of our community, this camp empowers, strengthens, and breaks generational bounds to ensure the success of our youth. Why the police department? I know most people are like, why you? Why the police department? So one of our duties as an SRO is to break that pipeline to prison. It's a known thing throughout our training as an SRO. The school to prison pipeline refers to the at-risk youth that due to outside reasons struggle in the school settings as well as life. Due to these circumstances, the path to incarceration includes stops. The pipeline reflects as law enforcement then has to habitually deal with these students on a regular basis outside of school. So we want to, as in, as in my duty, we want to monitor and find these at-risk youth, break the pipeline, and develop with them with resources to negate this before it occurs. And then how I find the at-risk youth, we're trained to identify and detect these youth in our schools. Um, we work closely with our psych school psychologists um, as well as our victims advocacy or reports that happen outside of our realm that aren't at the school. Um, we have road units that identify the juveniles out on the road, and later on we want to develop a document that will be given to the child's parent to allow them to contact us so we can intervene in situations that deem this youth at risk. For our plans on funding for the future, as our camp grows, I see major involvement with our community whether it be through fundraisers or donations, the sky is the limit, and I have a full heart in knowing that our growth will be exponential. So as I refer to the school to prison pipeline, what obviously what deals with the school to prison pipeline? So failing public schools, why? So most people look at them and say, he's failing, he has bad grades, but they don't actually look at the actual reason as to why the student's failing. Is it because he's not paying attention and just not taking school seriously? Or is it because he or she was up till 3 a.m. that morning taking care of their sister because mom is a night shift nurse and he has no, he has no time to study? Is it because her dad just died and she has no worth in herself anymore and doesn't know how to properly go about school and 
her dad is older and doesn't know and has never had a college degree or high school graduate doesn't know how to tell her, hey, you need to study, you need to do this. They don't ask those in-depth questions. So to identify those that fail in public school, you can go in more depth to figure out the why of why they're doing it. The schools now have a zero tolerance and other school discipline incidents in their school. Zero tolerance comes into play after an incident in the past. So now these first offender students that go into the school district and everything of that sort, they come into these high schools and they could be a first offender for the most minute thing and they could be sent to an alternative school and their entire education can be derailed. And so being sent to an alternative school and slapping them on the wrist and derailing their entire educational forefront of their career is going to delay them in their cognitive abilities as well as emotional. When they're alternative school placed, that disrupts their entire year. It disrupts their educational, emotional, and mental. So when they're taken from their school that they have known all these years and placed somewhere else with kids that are probably there for more severe offenses or less severe, they're all in the same mindset of no one's here for me. I'm being placed somewhere else because they don't want to see me. And as well as home life. Home life can go into all eight of these situations. That's where it stems from. Where are they coming from? With their home life, you have to look at their mom and dad situation. Every time I've had an incident at the high school from assault and battery to criminal sexual conduct with a minor of just any sort of thing that I have been a part of, the first thing I do when I walk into the office of a student, I introduce myself, I talk to the student, and I ask them, do you live with your mom or dad, or who are we going to contact? And they tell me grandma. And I, and as soon as they tell me grandma, I don't talk to them about the fight that just occurred. I don't talk to them about the CSC that's happening. I talk to them and figure out what kind of home life that they have. Why are you with your grandma? What happened to your mom and dad? And immediately in the five situations that are on my mind right now, all five of those students start crying because they do not have a mom or they do not have a dad or mom or dad is off their medications and are schizophrenic or bipolar and don't know how to regularly emote their emotions. And so now they do not know how to regularly do their emotions in school. Along with that, you have court involvement, family and criminal. So at home, they could have just went through a custody arrangement. They could have just went through parents' death and now they have to be placed with grandparents or they've been on the tr on the stand because they were molested, anything of that sort. And so I don't know if anyone in here has ever s stood up here or even right here. It's very intimidating. <laughs> so even testifying, um, if you've ever stood up there or done a presentation, you, you know how terrifying and how much pressure that you're under when you're doing that. And for a 13-year-old, 14 year old, 15, 16, 17, any one of those ages to stand in front of people that they do not know and to testify and try to win a case for themselves and prove their identity at such a young age is acute trauma at the most. So for them to have that and have that court involvement, they could have acute trauma to be less in school, to step back to have trust issues to not even trust teachers in their own life so that's something you have to look into as well as well as traumatic incidents and traumatic incidents can fall under any of the eight of these as well if they have ever been through anything as we've said i've been in columbia all week so being in columbia i've been with a lot of respectful agencies and one of the stories that she has allowed me to share with y'all is something near and dear to my heart that um, she had was very reluctantly to share with me. Um, this SRO had a car wreck right outside her high school. And so with that car wreck, a student got hit and was paralyzed. So with that, the SRO laid there holding this child and there was three other kids standing there and watched the incident happen. 
our first resp her first response to that was go leave go home telling the other three kids to do that while she rendered aid to that one student that one student was properly cared for not a good turnout but best better than what it could have been and then a week later we get called they get calls that hey my they get calls that um, their other three students that were on the scene haven't been to school any. And we're like, why are they at school? And so um, she says that she goes and visits them at home. And those three students have now been missing school because they're traumatized. They don't want to go to school because they're scared of getting hit by a car, as well as that one student that is no longer able to go to school right now. So the traumatic incidents, you don't just look at the most traumatic. You can look at just the bystanders, and they're going to get acute trauma as well. So with that, they could have been derailed in their entire educational career and led down a very wrong pipeline if someone hadn't said, hey, why aren't these kids at school? And if the SRO wasn't intervene with the mental health resources and resources that she had for these youth to not fall at risk and get back in school, then that could have been detrimental for those three kids' educational careers. Then we go into bullying. Bullying is a major factor in some schools. So bullying can be an array of things. With me in my past, it was, oh, she wears the same clothes. So with me, I was not under provided for. My parents provided very well for me, but I, they never taught me how to wash clothes. So... I didn't know how to wash clothes, so I ended up just waiting till they were up to date and, like, having a good day to wash clothes. So I only wore the clean clothes that they washed, and it was for those days. So I wore those clothes each and every week rotating. And so um, that was my bully. And then today, in today's age, when I look at other kids that are getting bullied, I look at them and I have to remind them of their worth in our school some of the kids nowadays that have nothing and don't know how to properly deal with their emotions lead to fighting, which leads me to my past, just this recent incident that's happened with one of my students that I hadn't developed this resource for yet. She was prior. She came to us um, just a month ago. Um, she was from another county. She came in and she was previously living with her grandma. No one knew her. She was new. She was tall. She was athletic. Everyone was like, you're going to play basketball? And so she comes into our uh, school and immediately all the girls are jealous. And so they immediately start rumors of her. And they immediately start picking fights. They immediately start telling other kids that she's dating this one and that one. Every rumor that you could imagine happened within a 48-hour span. And so within the 72 hours, she was sitting in class, and a teacher actually said something mean to her, and then all the other kids rallied around that person. And so this girl that was being called all these names got up and responded. And so with that and her background, she was up for expulsion now. And all because she had no resources, she had no parents, and she was being tossed in the system back and forth and did not know how to regulate her emotions to no level. And that leads me to unprovided, underprovided for. She was also living with her mom now. And if you visited her home, you would see that she sleeps on a half deflated mattress with no clothes in her um, closet. And mom is more, more worried about her next Gucci bag than her food distribution to her daughter. So that is something that I have picked up just here recently to provide resources for. And if it wasn't for me coming in at this time, there's no telling where this girl along the pipeline would have ended up. And with that pipeline, with everything that I've discussed, it leads me to what can I do? What, how can I be there? How can I fix, not fix, but be there as a resource 
and someone that can help in all of this. That leads me to have came up with the idea of Camp Worthy. Camp Worthy is designed for a female-led, multi-jurisdictional, four-day, three-night summer camp for at-risk girls ages 13 to 17. As part of Mon's ongoing effort to engage community youth, the camp will close the gap in year-round support for at-risk girls from our local schools. This overnight camp year-round um, mentor group is going to be building a bond of trust with the young girls in the community. It's going to empower and promote the worth of their abilities and increase self-efficiency, the belief in their ability to succeed. It's going to be led by a dedicated team of worthy female law enforcement individuals as well as worthy female community members. The camp will feel, be filled with engaging crafts and games that cultivate the worthy character, communication, stress management, critical thinking, life skills, and confidence. And when I say all of those things, they all have a meaning. And so with communication, we want these girls to con connect and express effectively, develop healthy friendships, team building, connect and collaborate and own their unique power and appreciate each other and their self. With stress management, they need it. They need to know when they are stressed and they need to know how to cope with that stress in a positive manner. And if they fail, they can fail forward. We And I tell that to them every single day. When they make a mistake, I'm like, so you made a mistake? This is the only mistake you're going to make like that because if we make one mistake, we're never going to make that same mistake again because we're going to learn from it. And so with that, they need to ditch labels, become limitless with a growing mindset. And for their critical thinking, we want them to define their values and what is important to them develop a foundation of the intake of our information and choices and how to properly make the right decision for themselves in everything that they do. Along with that, we're going to go into social media safety as well as drug and alcohol resistance. Life is more than likes. The kids live by the lifelike loves these days, and we don't need that. And it's not a part of their worth. It's not a part of their identity and not something that they desirably need. And with drug and alcohol resistance, we're going to uplift them to make the right choice. And with both of those programs, we do have stuff in place to initiate that. Integrating all of those objectives creates our worthy leader. It's being able to maintain and show the characteristics throughout daily life. Camp Worthy is going to be limited to 20 to 25 girls. It's going to be located either Rice or Rice Lodge or Lookup Lodge. The activities are going to include confidence building, self-defense self training, self-care, art classes, team building, leadership, and very much more. And as I said about the Age Out Mentor Program at the beginning of this, um, we're going to be with these kids ages 13 to 17 when they start this camp. And when they age out, of our camp, we're not just going to be like, all right, bye. We're going to set them up for success when 17-year-olds go out into adulthood. Because like I said, when I was 17, I felt like my only worth was to get married. And that was, and for me to serve someone else, and not even worry about who I was at the time or even develop where I am standing today. So with that, we want these chi these children to have a mentor going into their adult life. They're going to have a mentor that will develop a schedule that will be around their lives and be in and out and check-ins with them. The mentor will be the ear and the voice that the child needs venturing into adulthood, that connection, a person, and someone to forever be there for that child as long as time and that child will allow. The Camp Worthy leadership team that I've reached out to so far here in Malden, we have Miss Misty Ross, Kelly Stevenson, Christy Vickers, Harley Subchick. Within the Greenville City Police Department that we have in attendance today is Captain Paramore. City of Malden, we have Miss Lauren Carter. The Greenville County Sheriff's Office, we have the first canine female, which is Marina Whetstone. And in the Greenville County Community Volunteers, we have an array of different community members from the Greenville County School District. And then to end things, this is just a recap of all of Malden's programs and camps. And so you'll see the Citizens Academy, the Explorers Youth Academy, and along with that, Camp Worthy. And again, I thank y'all for your time. 
and just remember that that 17 year old girl in me thinks you as well and just know that knowing what could be is what drives me and I'll be the first in line to break the pipeline to advocate for our at-risk youth. Thank you. Committee, do you have any questions? Frank, I knew you would. <laughs> Thank you, you did an awesome, amazing job. I heard the presentation was really good and it was proven to be just that. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah, but my, my initial comments, thank you for all your service and everything that you do. Um, I think this is a very interesting idea um, that uh, hopefully we can bring to fruition. The, the one thing that I would uh, say, just as you were going through that last um, slide about the, the amount of people that would be involved in this, and I'm sure you already have this covered, um, but to make sure that all the folks that would be involved, not just the police department, but I, I like I saw Lauren's name on there, um, that they all go through background checks, safe environment training, um, that sort of thing to make sure that we are putting them with, you know what I mean? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but uh, overall, no, I appreciate you taking the time. It's, it's a, you put a lot of work into it. Thank you. Thank you all. So in, in deciding the participants for the camp, will it be the, the students that you're around daily at um, Golden Strip and at Malden High School? Is that the audience that you're going to capture or will it extend outside of that? So we're wanting to do an internal flyer to the school resources officers of the Greenville County School District, but primarily starting out, if we have primarily starting out, I did also didn't share this, but um, at Malden High School, Malden Middle School to high school, um, from last school year to the present, we've had 50 assault and battery cases, three intimidation cases, six drug cases, and 22 fondling CSC rape, molestation, and lewd acts on a child case, totaling out to 81 cases to present day. So with all of that happening, there's some kids out there right now that do not have any representation, do not have anything from the molestation to the assault and battery. Those kids out there probably don't have any resources right now. They're probably at home or probably thinking about what happened to them. So we're definitely going to do an in-depth research of the past cases from the 2020, from last school year to this year that those numbers are from. And we're going to see and try to go through our victim's advocacy and figure out how these kids are getting resources and what resources they have. Kind of leads to my second question. Do you think you'll have an application process or will you and your team do what you just said and identify those that you feel so we higher risk? So we will have an application process. That's what something that we're working with, with Ms. Ross and Christy and everyone. Um, and it's going to have, we're going to want kids wanting to have change, wanting to have us there. And so with the application uh, and everything like that, we're going to have in-depth things that they have to go through and talk, and we're going to have a policy agreement and everything of that sort that's going to be put in play. And we're kind of piggybacking because Misty is the one of the leaders of the Explorers program, and she has all of the liabilities, all of the paperwork that we'll need in this camp. So all of that's going to be shifted over and made into the image of Camp Worthy as well. Any other questions? Mr. Craig? I just want to say thank you for bringing this. This is great. And uh, thank you for all the work you've done. Thank you, sir. And thanks for the members of your team that came to support you tonight. We appreciate you all being here. All right. If there's nothing else, thank you. Thank we look forward to hearing more in the future. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Chief. <laughs> all right. Having to regroup after that one. Um, Lots of emotions in that, so um, excellent presentation. All right, we have no unfinished business tonight, so that leads us to new business. Um, the first thing on our agenda um, is the police and court operations security updates. Is that you? I'll tackle that one because okay. it's got everybody's name on it. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take care of it. Uh, yes, ma'am. So tonight we have a, a request uh, for a recommendation to council to approve the reallocation of $45,000 in ARPA funding 
or the police, uh, the police department and court operations security upgrades. Uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances, several important safety systems are beyond repair and need to be replaced. Some of these systems are more than a decade old and are necessary to ensure safe operations. And so we did include a, a little mini budget there and uh, we do have some security cameras that need to be replaced here at City Hall uh, within the police department uh, as well. Uh, the metal detector, as, as everyone saw who came in tonight, they were wanded. Uh, we have uh, stretched the life of that device uh, probably well beyond what it was manufactured for. It's 17 years old and at this point it's uh, the parts are hard to come by and we're not fixing the right part. And, so we're asking for a reappropriations to allow us uh, to purchase a new one. And then court administration is finalizing some, uh, would like to do some, some changes there to the windows to be able to serve more clients and also take advantage of the wheelchair access that we used to have and to reestablish that as well. And so uh, this was, uh, again, funding from ARPA that we, as we are starting to close out projects, we're starting to realize some projects came in under what we budgeted. Uh, or we have just some unavailable, unused revenue, or excuse me, um, uh, money left over that we'd like to utilize and reprogram uh, for these security upgrades. All right. Um, what's council um, committee's pleasure on the reallocation of uh, forty-five thousand in ARPA funds for these updates, Mr. Allgood? May I ask a question, real quick? Um, with the metal detector, as you pointed out, it's beyond where it needs to be. The one that we have got quoted here, I mean, I know there's all these new technologies for people going in and out. They've got things that they put at the school and all this stuff. Are we investing in just replacing the same old thing or is we getting something that has new technology? Perfect, thank you. That's my only question. Um, with that said, I would make a motion uh, to send this on to full council um, as stated, not to exceed 45,000. Thank you. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Any further discussion or questions? All those in favor of forwarding to full council the recommendation to reallocate 45,000 in ARPA funding for the police department and court operations security upgrades say aye. 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 None opposed, motion carries unanimously. Thank you all who were involved in pulling that together. Um, much needed. All right, next up we have, um, last but not least, the discussion on the no parking um, regulations. So did you want to tackle that as well, Mr. Duncan? Yes, ma'am. So tonight staff is requesting a discussion with the Public Safety Committee to relay re a uh, recent request by certain subdivisions to evaluate and potentially enact new restrictions for street parking, for on-street parking. Uh, we currently, as we've heard from a few speakers tonight, have had requests come in and uh, are seeing that with some of our developments, that parking is becoming a challenge, uh, not just for residents, but also for emergency vehicles and for uh, municipal vehicles in order to uh, perform their their weekly tasks. Uh, we do have currently in the code uh, an allowance to, um, according to section 38-48, uh, where parking may be restricted in the following ways. When signs are erected giving notice thereof, it shall be unlawful to park uh, a vehicle at any time upon any of the streets so designated. The city administrator may designate such areas with a recommendation of the traffic engineer or by direction of city council. And so what we were hoping to do was to get any feedback uh, or initial comments or things that we should think about in drafting a policy, because though we have some allowance there in code to make, make such designations, We've never, uh, at least in my tenure so far, have not received such requests, uh, don't uh, have a dedicated enforcement mechanism uh, or some other structures in place that allow us to go ahead and administer uh, this section um, as, as envisioned. Uh, we don't have a traffic engineer on staff, and so uh, that, that element there presents another dynamic that we'd have to look into and figure out how to, uh, to execute that section. Uh, so therefore, uh, basically just wanted some feedback before, and we hope to bring back a, a policy recommendation by uh, April's committee meeting 
for consideration and potentially approval. Um, thank you, Mr. Duncan. Um, and um, the notes to, to most of y'all, we had this conversation, um, Mr. Duncan and I and Chief Miller, probably six plus months ago, as some of us were seeing various degrees of parking issues, whether it was, um, you know, we have a lot of cars. So whether it's one house that has multiple families living there, which creates a lot of cars that end up on the street or just people parking in, on the street versus in their driveway. So um, thank you all for coming tonight and speaking of your problems in your particular neighborhoods. I don't think this is isolated to your two neighborhoods. I think it's a problem that's throughout our city. Um, I think some of the newer neighborhoods may have more problems because as you stated, there's, they're not long driveways. So you're limited as to where you can park. So for me, I would challenge staff to, as you stated, to come back to committee with um, an ordinance that would, I think we have to be careful um, because we want it to be enforceable. So I think we need to look at, for me personally, parking on, a certain side of the street, perhaps. The signage concerns me because are we gonna put signs up throughout all the neighborhoods? So that that portion I have concerns about, but I think there's some things we can do to, to tackle um, the issue, but I'd like for us to really think it through and do it right versus kind of jumping in and ha hazardly perhaps. So um, that's where I stand. I, I think we also need just thinking off the cuff um, I think parking on one side of the street would eliminate this problem, but we have to be mindful that people have um, people who are visiting for a long weekend and that sort of thing. So I think it's doable, but I think there's exceptions that we need to, to think about. And then again, the how we're going to enforce it, how and when. Mr. Crayling? Um, my only concern is to keep it simple. You know, just uh, we, we, sometimes we don't have to overthink it. We can always say, oops, we made a mistake and go back. Uh, but I'd like, I think if, if you know, there's dealing with engineers all day long, sometimes you don't want to get a traffic engineer involved if you can keep it simple. And so what I'm, I'm suggesting is whatever, you know, we come up with, say, hey, we think this is going to work uh, as far as enforcing your TF tickets, right? If we come up with a, with a uh, policy around that, but. Uh, keep it simple. We have to make sure the safety that police and fire can get in and out. That's prior number one priority. Trash, of course, being a being also important, but uh, I, I'd hate to have an issue we couldn't get an ambulance in and out for somebody who needed it. So I would look at those things, and but just keep it simple so we're not. I don't want to overthink this. Um, it's we're talking signs and we're talking tickets, right? Potentially, it's something simple. And let's go ahead and get it moved on versus I don't want to overthink it. And we're sitting here six months later and we just still don't have an answer for this. And to piggyback on that, I wouldn't disagree to keep it simple, but that at the same time, it has to be enforceable. So, um, else, Mr. Allgood? Going back to what was said in terms of, of safety, um, I think this goes back to conversations we had earlier about zoning and and comprehensive plan and how are we building our roads. Um, I do think that there's not going to, I don't think there's going to be a universal policy here in terms of, well, we need to all of a sudden uh, enforce it across all communities. I think it needs to be by community. Um, if the, it, it's in much similar way that we do with the, uh, the speed humps where uh, I, I got a smile out of that one. Um, but where the community comes and if that's what the community desires, then I think it makes sense for, for that community to, 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 to get that. Um, but I would go back to um, uh, Chief McCone and say, particularly as we're looking at this comprehensive plan, we're looking at regulations and different things. What should we be building when we build roads? And should they be bigger than what we are? If we've gotten really condensed, um, things are small. And as you pointed out, a lot of these new neighborhoods, the driveways are very short. So where where do people park? Um, if, I don't know, a kid named Quinn decided to come home from college 
from USC and he needed to park in the driveway, we're going to give him a ticket. And let's say we have like a celebration for that child. You know, what, what do we do? So yes, we need to make sure it's enforceable. I think it needs to be based on uh, looking at in the future, how are we building our roads? I also feel like um, for their existing neighborhoods, it needs to be their call um, when it comes to uh, if we do add some levels of enforcement um, that, that, that they're making those decisions, not us. Um, so that's that's my take. Good comments. Um, and, and a lot of times I think it's on education. So hopefully our neighborhoods can educate our residents or try to do that first. I know in, in my neighborhood, we have swim meets um, the month of June at home. And that's one of the first things that happens. There's an email that goes out and the parents are told park on a certain side of the street. And amazingly, it's how many kids, Frank, at those, I mean, cars. I mean, there's. 75. Uh, yeah. So say two cars Times per two. kid. <laughs> but of course, we're hosting those because together. it doesn't, we can't have them in another neighborhood. But yeah. But, um, but amazingly, all of those folks follow the instructions and they all park on one side of the road for all of those meets. So. And, and, and maybe there is a situation where on the on the entrance of the subdivision, there is one singular sign and that we're not having to put a sign every 10 feet like we did at Club Epic, right? I mean, that was ridiculous, the amount of signs that we have out there, but there was a reason why we had to do it. Of course, I say we, I wasn't even here at that point. <laughs> um, but we don't want to get into that either where we're having don't park in front of my yard signs every house. So... Yeah, I think there is something there. We There's something that we can do. It's just a matter of putting heads together and figuring out what that is. And it may not be next month, and I'm okay with that. Okay, no problem. I'd rather, it, yeah, let's think through it. We'll do. Uh, one of the things that uh, that we're looking at is, is, is policy, not exactly the similar, but the same structural policy as the, um, the, the traffic study policy. So then that way we've got clear guidelines on how we receive these requests, how they're processed, input from the HOA, uh, you know, mandatory input, things like that. So we're going to, we're going to take our time and, and looking at signage, looking at, at markings, painting on roadways to designate no parking. So we're, we're looking at across the board approach. So, um, but yeah, in the next month or two, we'll be back for sure. Perfect. Yeah. And, and just a quick thought. I mean, something as simple as uh, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5, you're not parking on the street. That will should get rid of the ones that are habitual offenders and still allow for, oh, we're having friends over on the weekend or, oh, it's after five o'clock. We're inviting friends over for for a dinner and not getting into ticketing people that we don't need to ticket. That's always also your responsibility as a homeowner to tell your guest, don't park on both sides of the street. Okay. All right. We'll work on that. Okay. All right, if nothing else, we'll go on to our last public comment. Mr. Matney. Oh, here we go. George Dowling, 204 Fieldgate Court, uh, Planners Road President. Uh, Malden resident since 2000. Uh, my first stint on the board in about 2006, we did actually solicit Malden um, mayor and actually got um, stop signs to put in on Fieldgate Road. We did it through an NTSB and stuff of that nature for traffic calming. So that was one thing that did help, at least in that situation. But I do know that the NTSB situation is a little tricky, and sometimes the guidelines do not solicit, or sorry, the guidelines from NTSB don't actually say that humps are actually valid in the situation or in that cause. So I caution everyone on this side of the aisle to make sure that they call in and make sure that everybody calls in so that there's a good record account on the police. Um, however, in our situation in our neighborhood, Planters Row, uh, I believe this predates even Chief Turner. Um, when I was on the board from 2006 to 2009, we were told that as long as we put sign up signage up at all entrances in our neighborhood, which are still there, by the way, um, no overnight parking. Um, Malden had told us that if we had gotten the signs paid for through a neighborhood, and then we put them up, they would enforce the no parking on the streets. But that never seemed to come to bear. Um, the absence of this one signage, signage doesn't necessarily work, but the absence here is the, the absence of follow through or presence. 
uh, when we first got into Malden in the neighborhood, we used to have a police officer that I actually go through and everyone knew their names and they would come through and make sure that everything was fine. And I know that that has changed over time, but I, I think it's more complicated. Um, I, I will offer my humble any opinions or anything else if you want to loop me in to see if there's anything I can offer with my long tenure here at the, at, at the city, but um, it's a tricky situation. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Oh, Mr. Matney, almost forgot. How did I? I'm not forgettable. No, um, I, I just wanted to to take a second to thank and applaud Officer Bonds. Um, being a school resource officer is a very different kind of policing. You know, you're, you're not a road officer. Um, you're a cop, you're a preacher, you're a teacher, you're a parent. Um, you're dealing with kids sometimes in, in, in their worst moments uh, when they're making some bad decisions, but um, you're all, your job is also to make sure that that school stays safe. Some of y'all may have heard me say that there are 42 towns in South Carolina that have smaller populations than the student body of Malden High School. Um, so just think about the importance of law enforcement in that school and keeping our kids safe. Um, Chief, she actually reminds me of another school resource officer, different voice, definitely different look, but the, the eye is there. It is the look that says that I am here for these kids and I want to do what I can. Um, you know, Tony Kutsos was, um, was one of the best. And when, when he had the, the youth academy, his focus was to make sure that those kids during the summer learned what it was like to be a productive member of the Malden community. Uh, and I, I think that what you're trying to do here um, really is an extension of that um, at a time where it's sorely needed. So thank you for all of the effort that you've put into it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Matney. No other um, public comment? Seeing none, we'll move to committee concerns or comment. We're shaking heads, no? All right, adjournment. So moved. Second. All in favor of adjournment, say aye. 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 We stand adjourned at 9, 839. Let's transpose those.